folks just kind of absorb it and save your questions for maybe after the meeting or uh, we'll probably reschedule another meeting and sometime to call it input if you don't mind because we have a lot to cover tonight. Uh, we have a, well, I guess we should do a roll call first. Go to start down there, Ron. Ron Chandler, City Manager. Right ahead of the Council. Judy Casper, City Council. Nick Anderson. Yeah, Mayor Don Williams. Kip Ward. Susan Walkie. Richard Townsend, Planning Group, and Kathy and Richard. Thank you. Um, we had a request to change the agenda around just a little bit. Instead of going into emergency preparedness, we're going to move up with, without objection, uh, move up to homelessness in Lincoln City possible actions discussion with the uh, council. Two that we discussed another time. No, Councilor Kessler just asked to switch them. Instead of oh, emergency right. preparedness being one, it'll be two. Yeah. Okay, so correct. Homelessness and Lincoln City possible actions, Ron. Okay, the purpose of our meeting tonight, like our one we had a couple weeks ago, is to uh, for the staff to do a little bit of talking and you to do a lot of bit of talking. Uh, with the idea of giving us a sense of direction, what your priorities will be. We'll have one more of these meetings um, a month from now and talk about uh, a few other uh, parts of the city's operation. And then following that, we'll bring back, based upon what we heard, uh, what we believe your priorities uh, are and then have you approve those. So tonight we're going to cover homelessness, uh, emergency preparedness, uh, the Visitors Prevention Bureau, and planning. Now, we uh, last in our last meeting, I really did like the fact that we had a firm time to end. Uh, and uh, any better at 8 30 or 9 o'clock is about the time people start blazing over in their eyes. Um, so, if there's a time you guys want to end, we can, we can easily carry the discussion to the next meeting. Okay. And, Ron, just uh, before I forget, I just want to uh, you know, suspend the uh, need to get the chair's uh, permission to speak. So as long as everyone just takes their turn, we don't overlap. So the speakers, so the microphones pick us up. We'll just go ahead and have your say whenever you want. Um, on uh, December 12th, I gave a presentation during the city council meeting. And, uh, and part of that presentation, I'm not going to go through all of it, was that we uh, we identified, and most of this work came through the county and the very good work that they have done, the causes for homelessness. And they were identified as poverty, a lack of living wage jobs, unavailable, unavailability of safe, decent, affordable housing, domestic violence, physical and mental health issues, substance abuse, lack of transportation, lack of child care, poor credit history, lack of family support and support networks. We also discussed many of the organizations that provide services to the homeless and the city's financial contributions. Now, Councilor Hinton had uh, sent me a note, I think it was last week, saying, can you give us a little bit about the different organizations that, was in, that, were, that were in my memo? And I gave that to you tonight. And it's just most of that came off the uh, web pages of the different organizations. Um, as I mentioned in the past 10 years, uh, the city has contributed approximately $440,000 to organizations that in one way or another serve the homeless. I finished that presentation by identifying what I believe is the next step, and that is to identify future actions the city council may take as it pertains to homeless, homelessness. Uh, this identification process should include where you want to go and where you don't want to go. Uh, one of the most helpful things that will happen for the city staff is to know the parameters within the next steps will be taken. For example, if you feel that the city is not equipped and should not uh, run a homeless program, that's good to know so that we don't go down the road of trying to do that. And, uh, and so anyway, so what we're looking at is really for some direction, some ideas of where you would like to go. Now, since that meeting, um, um, on the 12th, there have been several people who came and, and visited with me. Uh, one of those was Mr. Rich Cottrell and, uh, with Homeless Solutions, and he has a proposal and asked that I distribute that to you tonight. It's your first look at it. We won't be going 
through it in detail, but it's there before you um, on, on a proposal of the home solution path. Um, so with that, um, I know that there's been much discussion that you have had with your constituents, uh, discussions that I've had with you, um, discussions you've had with different organizations, and so uh, that puts us as to where we are and uh, where you think we should to begin a discussion where you think we should go on this issue. Okay. Anyone would like to start this off? Sure. Um, I've, I've kind of delved into each of these areas myself and talked with people who work there, talked with recipients, and it seems like the overall picture is we're not, we're not getting together. Um, first of all, we need services, and I don't know if we should be county services, private services, we need mental, medical services. Um, we need even a place where they can go and get food stamps. As of now, there's, there's once a month and once a week people can come and get food stamps. Our transportation is lacking because people can't get to these places. There's a bus route that goes once every hour. Um, I try to find where to buy bus passes because we're going to give them away. And it seems you only purchase them on the bus, and nobody knows that except one person I've talked to who purchased them on the bus. Um, People need to be safe. They need to be off the streets. They need services surrounding them. There was a, a little research that I thought was kind of interesting. In 79, uh, 71 to 79, if anybody remembers, Reagan is the one who eliminated mental institutions and health programs in California. And at the same time, Jimmy Carter was president from 77 to 81. And so he was elaborating the Mental Health Systems Act which he spent three and a half years getting programs together which would take community-centered resources and clinics and put them into the community. And Reagan came into office um, as president in 1981 to 89. He eliminated all of the mental institutions in the United States. And that's why they say all the mental uh, patients were let loose. Practically, yes, because they were supposed to go in the communities, but there was no funding put to it. Um, so that's kind of how we end up in the position that we are now. Um, the trend in the uh, 1980 and 1990 was to use um, transitional housing and teach life skills. But now it's getting so we need a place for people to be, be safe, and then give them the skills. In fact, um, our state is last, very last, to have access to mental health services. This was a study that was done in 2013. It was before the ACA um, became available, and it also did not include insured children. I'm sorry, what's the ACA? Uh, oh, the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act. Um, those with highest access to care were like Minnesota, Maine, Connecticut, Vermont, South Dakota, New Jersey, North Dakota, Iowa, Arkansas, New York. Lowest, that's us. Uh, lower than above us was Virginia, Louisiana, Indiana. Idaho, Utah, Washington, Rhode Island, Nevada, Arizona. Oregon is dead last. Oregon is also dead last. I know it's Deanna Davis. In homeless people who are on the streets. This is disgusting. This is despicable. Um, we need to have more services. It either has to come from the state or the county. And we need one, it seems like we need one location. There's different organizations doing different things in different areas and spending a lot of money. One, um, one program, the a volunteer, their coordinator, spends $1,200 a month, $950 for the rent and $250 for the utility, and she does this on her own. This is a day center for the homeless and the needy, and I think that's very important. But after that, the homeless are left nowhere. Um, we use the government services as they are now because the police might pick up somebody who has a, a record or there's some kind of a disturbance going on. There might be um, use for government services when someone is injured and the fire emergency um, tech people show up and bring these people to the homeless shelters or the day centers. There has to be a place that's central in the city for people to congregate and receive services and benefits. Um, I think we need an organization, either Nonprofit, and it seems like the city would be a good person to find some property logistically. There seems to be a coordinator that's needed to figure this all out. 
um, a location and some funding for this. And I, I think it should be at the top of our list because homeless people, there's also needy people. I know people right now who are paying $1,000 a month. They have jobs and living in a motel. Um, they can't cook. Her boyfriend is a cook at one of the facilities in town, so they go when there's no customers and cook their meals. So it's not just the homeless. This is part of the affordable housing that we need. And I think it needs coordination. And I think we need to somehow find a direction as a city council to um, facilitate this. And I was, I was glad to see this project presented to me tonight. And I look forward to hearing more about it. So um, that's my two cents. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Or something? I think there needs to be a definition between homeless and houseless. And <clears throat> if you're going to say homeless as to people that are living here as best they can, they're registered to vote here, they're working here, they get their mail somewhere in here, I don't think that's the same as being homeless. Uh, homeless is kind of lacking a permanent home, you're transient, you're, your idea is not to stay here. And so if there's a, a, a difference between homeless and houseless. I think that might help in kind of seeing a more immediate emergency help and long-term, you know, sustaining help and the difference between those two things. Um, also, if there could be, if it's homeless and transient and we're providing the services, could there be volunteer opportunities for those people to do something to have a purpose and say, hey, we're we have this green space or these things that need something cleaned up or something. Something that would would allow them to do something while they're we're receiving the services that they're doing that's, you know, we need volunteer anyway. Um, uh, if there was a, you know, um, having places for homeless people to be is important. Um, if they're homeless and that's their decision, do we want them as you, let's just say, across from the eventuary, the turn right there, when you walk through there, you can smell the homelessness that is happening there. So if, you know, are you safe, are you secure, what's going on, you see all the debris one foot behind the greenery. So if you had a place that these people could go to, if we had three campsites that we rented all year long that could be, you, here's your voucher for the week, and you want to camp and be homeless? Okay, here's the place to do it. Not on the side of the road where kids walk and people don't know what's going on and, and have that kind of uneasy feeling in our own town. You know, I don't feel comfortable walking through some of the places because I don't, I can smell before I see things that happen and I'm just one person and I don't know how many people are behind the set of bushes. But if they're and it could be fine. It's fine. I'm, obviously, I'm here. I'm not saying it's. I'm going to get murdered. But they're, you know, it's a real thing that is just beyond the the, the hedge. It's happening right there. So um, I think it's important to recognize that um, thing. And, and additionally, the home, if you have homeless children in school wishing to stay here and be. I don't know what the legal age is to make the decisions like, I, you know, if you want to live with one divorce plan or another, there's a legal education age, I don't know. But if the student is able to say, hey, I want to stay here, how can I stay here and finish school? Why are they being punished for their houselessness that is happening if the home environment is that bad? So is there a way that you could say, if you're of this, this age and of this passing grade requirement and have recommendations from a teacher or a set of teachers, could there be somewhere where I can go and stay here and, and, and finish, and so I can get out of it? Um, and that, that's a mobile home or an RV something, I don't know, but it's something that would help, or volunteers, people that say, okay, if you meet this requirement, you can stay in this extra bedroom that I have. You know, it's there. There's plenty of space. We all know there's plenty of space here. It's uh, how can we use it to benefit everybody? Um, and that we care. If you do that, you, you can say that the community cares about your success. You can say send a clear message. We, uh, this is enough. We want us. We, we're going to do it. This is what we're going to do. And so if you say, hey, we're going to do it, people will go. Are you sure? Because I want to do it, and I'm not quite sure, but, you know, here, here we go. So I think that would help get participation. 
And, you know, Councilor, if I could interrupt and respond to that. Um, and, and I totally agree with what both you and Councilor Casper have said uh, for the most part. But I think what we're looking for tonight is direction to the city staff. What can we tell them that we would like them to proceed with? Um, we all have our emotions in this high, or very high in the charge, but what Ron's looking for is which direction do you want me to go tonight? Where do we start? And I, I, I'm just, you know, not, I don't want to minimize what you've said, but if we're going to start tackling this, we need to kind of start focusing. Let me, uh, uh, based on the comments that we've heard, let me ask a question that might help facilitate what Marilyn was just talking about. So the two comments we heard were about the creation of a program, okay? Or programs that would that would uh, deal with homelessness, um, whatever components they take in. So, I, the first question that I would ask of you is: um, Do you want to operate a program, or do you want to work with groups that operate programs? In other words, do you want the city to run a homeless program, or do you want uh, to work with groups to do that? If I may, um, I've um, been thinking about this quite a bit. I've talked with a few people. I have my own opinions. I've done a little bit of research um, looking at um, the city of Eugene, who has they put together a few programs. But there's been some consistency with all of this, and one of it is a shelter of some sort and understanding that there are a variety of reasons of why people are homeless. And so if we just can leave that aside for a minute while we're trying to sort this out. The idea of resources, as Judy was talking about, that's the other thing that's been consistently talked about. Coordination of all of whatever it is that we end up with has been a consistent um, thing that people have said. So there are some kernels of these things that actually could help to drive us somewhere. And also, um, I don't think, and I, I really, I don't think that what we are trying to do here is to replicate anything that the county does. The county has a certain set of, of um, work, and we in the city has as something different and separate. And so I don't think that we are trying to step on anyone's toes or take over anybody's responsibilities. I don't think that's it. And furthermore, I don't think that the city should be in the long-term um, uh, business of um, a shelter. I think that perhaps if there's a pilot that we can try for a while that works for this city and it's um, homeless constituents, that would be helpful, and, um, but I do think that it's, that we would look more to the nonprofits that help um, already, they've done the, they've done the heavy lifting already, they know what they're doing, they know, know how they're doing, but I would like to see all of that come together in a coordinated way, so perhaps what Judy was saying with, um, you know, trying to to find a location and a coordinator, and I don't know how much of that is the city's responsibility or how far we want to go with that, but um, there seems to be a need for this. And I would just say this, that the roof over the head, the showers, and the toilets are essential. And that's, if I were going to say what our goals were, that would, that would be what I would go for. Um, so then back to what Ron was asking is, okay, let's break it down, do you, and again, whatever we say tonight is just a discussion, there's no vote being taken and you can change your mind later, so you're not bound anything here, is do we want to direct the city staff to build a homeless shelter? Build one? Yeah, I mean, let's just start the that discussion. Do we want, or to own and operate one? I don't think we should. No, I, uh, I am very encouraged by this. No, but I'm just trying to narrow this discussion down. So, so that's a no. We're not going to go in that direction. Okay. So then the next thing would be: Do we partner with a group to identify a homeless shelter? Do we want a homeless shelter in this town? 
I'm very encouraged by this proposal that we've been given, and I'd like opportunity to, to review it. Absolutely. Um, but Absolutely. no, I don't feel that it should be the city's ongoing responsibility. <coughs> but I think that we should be assisting. I, I don't think it should be the churches either, because um, to be a host hosting site, I believe you have to have insurance, liability insurance. So that puts a lot of strain on um, the churches. And so I think if the city could initially start and, and help the process to you know, assume responsibility, if we were to locate a, a site that could be maybe turned into a shelter or, or facilities or coordination. And if we had people from Habitat for Humanity to help us you know, volunteer to improve it somehow. Because people seem to need a place where they can call home to have a P.O. box. You need a P.O. box to get services. You can't get anything done unless you have an address. Right, absolutely. Again, and right. they need like a place for walkers to put their stuff. So what you're saying is it, you're in favor of a, a, a private or non-profit city collaboration? Yes. I think that's the right way to put it is rather than what is needed yet to answer the question is city to be a participant in a solution but I don't view the city proposing a solution um, that we believe on anything but okay. a participant okay well then I'm just trying to get the right direction for Ron and if that's you know if your opinion is, is what the council believes then we can give them that direction to say so I should participate, but not take the lead on it. And I interrupted a thought. No, thanks. That's right. And I showed you some information. This is a sheet on the questionnaire that, that, that is taken in by um, the homeless shelter and the Shiloh Gathering Center. This is an example of how information is gathered. Participants, Allison, you want to share this with the audience? I think it's a good start. Um, a good start. Um, a good start just to look at how they're gathering the information. Somebody here is taking the initiative to do this. Right. To set this up. So there's, yeah. there's, not, there's steps in, in motion already. We have to somehow connect this all together so we're all going in the same direction. I, I, I completely agree. I'm still just trying to keep us. What are we going to tell Ron to do tonight? <laughs> is, there, is there a homeless representative to find out what they want? Well, not tonight. Here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we have somebody that, that, that's I think that's important. But I, have, yeah, I haven't had one. Well, well, can I just ask? It's yeah. really a good question. Because this is a question we've asked of the staff. There are lots of homeless advocates, and we have talked with a lot of them. They are going to probably know better than anybody else, but we have not talked to somebody who is homeless. Okay, now the advocates certainly have, and those who have participated have, or if any of us have participated, but as a group, as a city organization, we have not done it. I've been homeless. I know what it's like. Well, then maybe you could share what would you have liked the city where you're at? I, I explain you, that. No, no, I, I understand that. But again, you know, we have to decide what what role the city of Lincoln City will play versus the private sector versus the nonprofit sector. Right. I'm, I, I'm saying what it would have been nice. Right. And we all get to decide with the help of, you know, what it will be. Mm -hmm. Could we identify an office or a space to begin with so these people can be there as a group member of the shower? I, I'm going back to the shower. I'm going to stay on the shower here because. Um, what do you want for shower vouch? Get shower vouch? Right, but Ron will tell you a story that that's not exactly a success. That's my agree. So I'm just saying, you, you, you know how you feel like you get out of the shower, you're lying, you're awake, let's go. Well, everyone deserves that. So whatever we do, I think has to include showers. So, Mayor, I, I guess, you know, it's tough, hurting sheep. 
herding cats, and that's where this discussion I think is going, and it shouldn't, shouldn't be surprising because we've already identified that homelessness has a bunch of different causes and effects and solutions. You know, for, for me, uh, I think that the key element, again, is if we can agree uh, that we see it as a need and an issue in Lincoln City homelessness, we want to be a participant. Now, that can come, but I don't know what that means. Uh, it could, we could even go further and say, limited simply to dollars. You know, but I'm, I'm not ready to make that decision until I see some proposals from the experts, and it's not me on this subject. And it might be a variety of different things for different venues of homelessness. So I would say once we can make a decision that we want to participate, um, as a partner, not a lead, and quite frankly, even renting a building says you're taking the lead at this point without a plan. So somehow we've got to, you know, this is a start. Maybe in here is a, a proposal that we could get behind the council and say, yeah, what, what do they want us to do in this world? Well, maybe it's simply writing a check. You know, and that'd be great. You know, we bring it before council and move. But, but I'd say we need some proposals to say how do they want this entity called the city to participate. And I would go one step further and say I, I would like everybody if they could come together and find out what one thing they are all, all of these organizations are doing. What is the thing? What is it that we are trying to help provide? And um, I keep going back to the idea of a pilot project. We can try something out, and if it's not working, then try something else. And I'm going back to um, the city of Eugene. They have the 10-year plan, and other cities have actual plans for the steps of how of how they will all work together, not just the city. I think the city just helps provide um, maybe the planning part of it, but um, they don't do all of these things. We just keep things moving along with the idea of, you know, pretty soon we'll be it smaller and smaller, whatever it is. Even as you say that, I, I guess I'm, I'm not getting the message as to are you expecting the city to throw out the net and gather people and come up? That's an idea. No, not what I'm interested in. I, I, that's my point. Is the is, coordination is what we need so we know what the it is? I mean, we all have had our discussions with people, and everybody has similar but a little bit different ideas, perhaps. But why not we let those who deal it have experience in the field? That's what I'm talking. About. Well, oh, maybe we're good. not connecting. Well, one thing I, I, I saw uh, in living color uh, with the emergency shelter operating my place was it's easy to say, okay, uh, we're going to have an emergency shelter. And now within that, there's this, this these substrates of different people who can and can't use these. So we have a uh, single gal come in. She's clean, she's sober, she needs somewhere to sleep. Great, we can take care of you. We have a guy stumbling off the street, and I mean stumbling, who can barely get a word out, who's just dead drunk. Well, okay, we can still just roll him into a cot, and he's okay. Then we have the guy with the dog, and then we have the smokers, and then we have the people with the cars who don't want to leave their stuff, and then a, a, a guy showed up with a truckload of stuff, and had, the guy was just, someone was just giving him a ride. Like, well, I need somewhere to put my stuff. Okay, so there's all these levels of care, and so... For me, and again, I'm not in charge of this. If I were to say, could we, on these, I'll pick the one. Where, do, which one do you want to start with? And let's just, and then maybe flesh that out. And, and, and I agree with the idea of a coordinator. Now, whether that's a city staffer or not, or we allow the city to give them a, an office space. You know, we have incubation space downstairs, or we could say this is now the emergency coordinator, health and human service emergency coordinator position, whatever it is, we let them use that space. Um, 
one thing I find it is we have lots of places that offer help, but on their time frame. So when I come across a guy who's shivering cold on Sunday at 6 p.m., he's a veteran. I can't get a hold of anyone from the Veterans Administration. I can't get a hold of anyone except the hospital to take care of this guy. Well, it sure would be nice to be able to pick up that phone and go, ah, I need to get this guy somewhere. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, if I were to go back to that, where do you want to start? I mean, if, if that's a fair question. Do you want to take care of families? Do you want to take care of... Don, I think the basic need, <clears throat> kind of a perk of not living in a third world country, I think at a minimum, we should be able to offer these people a warm place to sleep food to eat and, uh, and have a level of safety building that perhaps those are uh, obtainable and are largely being done now by a couple of churches. Uh, I'm sure they'll get burned out before too long. Uh, but it, it is responsible and it works and you can, it's doable, very doable. And once you get that out, then you can proceed to these other things. You know, we're going to have an inflow of homeless as part of the global economy. Uh, our workers are having to compete with you know, uh, governments that, that pay 70 cents, a, 70 cents a day, you know. So uh, those guys left with minimum skills, uh, they're going to multiply. And uh, so where there's no fixing this. It's, you know, just trying to make sure that, that people have just the, the most basic care available. That's something we can do to get off of our plate. And if the churches need help, if the churches need a shower, maybe we give them built a couple showers. I mean, but if we can help the people that are doing it now, and I haven't read this this, this proposal, but it's awfully nice to get one. And uh, that would be my opinion. Help the people that are doing the work now because they're doing a great job before they get burned out and they're done. So if I could ask then, you'd be in favor of providing uh, resources to these groups? Absolutely. Okay, but not worrying about the city taking control of it. The city doesn't not belong in this business. Okay. But we can sure support those people that have that as their passion and are doing the work. Is there a consensus on that or no? Or? I think that might be one option. Yeah, that's all we're asking for tonight. It's, it's a little bit of what I'm hearing, Dan, if I can try to get a synopsis of this. There will need to be at least an uh, initial few phone calls from the staff to the different organizations that uh, service the homeless. Asking if somebody will volunteer to step forward to coordinate with the other organizations and develop a proposal. We may already have it before us, or after some other organizations work with it, maybe change some. Uh, but anyways, and then to come back with a proposal. And the one boundary that I've heard so far is that the city does not want to run a program. We will, we're willing to assist, to help, uh, resources, and not to actually operate a, a program. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? And I would love to keep pushing uh, the county to bring some resources down here. We have plenty of office space. Here, here. Yeah. How much space is occupied upstairs? Oh, uh, there's uh, about a half the space. space. If there was a way to retrofit it to be a, a housing or a processing center, to where these organizations could rent space at a reduced rate upstairs and house and have their functions upstairs, that way they're all in the same place. And it's not this door, it's that door. And then they have their own thing. And if we front of the cost to retrofit the available space, that would be our buy-in to them renting the space reduced and then have everything there so it's not that or it's this place. And then we would make money by their rent and we're using city-owned space that we're not generating revenue. Okay, okay. So you're, you're talking about just office space? Well, whatever the you're not talking housing. Whatever it could be, if that's the if that's insurable, if that's something that we could have in that space effectively, then yeah. But if not, then they could all be there without the housing. 
but I mean, I'm sure you can put a shower in the kitchen or it has a kitchen or whatever. You know, you can, some of it's there already, and then you just expand that to provide that service. You know, what's our square footage downstairs? Right now, the, the right now the, all the facilities downstairs are being used. So, right. Yeah. Uh, we switched the uh, the backpack program. All the fire from the old mm -hmm. firehouse into that building. So all of the rooms downstairs now are being used. All right. Well. You know, all of these together kind of form a Gideon's knot, and if we try to salt and hack it in two, you know, we're going to have to do this strand by strand. I'm grateful that we were able to do what we can. Mayor, was there any other comments? I think I've, I think I've got something to work with. Council. I'd just like to um, say again that I think the coordination and effort has to be a part of it, as well as um, some the, the county, I think the county could be here two, three days a week, that'd be fine. So there's a place where people can go to get resources, find out about what's available, and back to the shower. Whatever that looks like. There is a truck that runs around in different states that has two showers in it. I, think they, I can't remember how many showers that um, they can provide, but it's just a big truck that can have a shower. There is one uh, issue that I need to bring forward to you and just simply let you know what the, what the staff is doing on this. You know, um, the, the city staff has given vouchers. Uh, to people to use to come to the facility, um, the community center, to sh for showers. We noticed in the last two or three months that uh, we're being a bit overwhelmed by the number of people that are coming in. Um, uh, many of them are not just once, but several times they come in. Uh, for example, in the month of January, we sold 32 vouchers to take a shower that cost $2.50, uh, but we had uh, almost 130 uh, that were uh, given away by, by one or more other organizations. Um, that's something that we've had to scale back on. Uh, we found that there's been some conflict between the patrons uh, that are coming to bank to, uh, for recreation purposes versus those that are coming for shower purposes. Uh, and so it, the way I've described it is it's, it's changing the nature of the uh, community center from a recreation facility to a welfare facility. And so I just want to let you know that we have cut that back to sort of about, uh, to about 60 per month for about two per day. Is there a way, what are the, what, is there a way to provide showers only from like 7 to 8 p.m. or we've, something like we've that. We've done that where it's limited uh, up until about 11 in the morning from about 8 to 11 when we don't have children and things like that. But it's been spilled over and there's been a lot of cleaning work. Uh, there's, it's just been, it's been overwhelming to the staff. And even with those hours, it's been crossing over where it's affecting some of the patients as well. You have a plan to cut back? Well, we did. We've uh, sent, uh, we sent a note out to all of the organizations that have done this and said that this is the cap on the amount that you can give out during the month. Well, the 50, there's four organizations we work with and we're giving them 15 15, 15, 15, 15. Could, could someone serve as a volunteer to sort of monitor what goes on here? 
perhaps. Uh, I'd have to talk a little bit more with uh, the start the education program and say this is what goes on there. Perhaps. Um, um, uh, I need to talk a little bit more with uh, Gail Kimberly on how to, how to approach that. So. Okay. All right, get you started. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, we're going to go back to uh, emergency preparedness activity by the City of Lincoln City and August 21st from our team, e Okay, emergency preparedness. Okay, I think all of you know Mark Nicholson. He is our emergency preparedness coordinator and has done a just marvelous job uh, in our training and our programs. Uh, the city has um, four broad categories uh, and, or tasks for the emergency preparedness program. The first is to ensure that all city employees pass the minimum uh, federal emergency management or FEMA course requirements. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we're about 75 percent. Uh, um, FEMA has courses that uh, begins with they call they begin with their they call their ICS or Incident Command System level 100 and 200. Those are all required for all employees, including city council members, to take. You can take those online. So, if our council, if you haven't taken them, please do. The reason why they're so important to take is because well, there's two reasons. The first is you need to know these things in the case of emergency. The second is, is that if you don't have these, you may, FEMA may not reimburse you for the cost of emergencies. And so it's important to take those. So right now we're about 75% of our employees that have, um, that have uh, completed that. The second item is to coordinate with other emergency preparedness organizations. The third. Um, the well, third is that something we could do as a, as a work session? Well, yes. In fact, like what we did is we brought our employees in. We had a computer room in the back. They took the class together, and we knocked them all out. Very easily. Mark, how long is the class? The, I mean, the, the FEMA estimated, one, these are online. You can do them at home on a computer. So what's the address? It doesn't have to be. I'll, I'll, I'll send a link. Oh. Um, it's... FEMA training probably it would show up. The courses we're taught, there's a few others that are more specific for council that might be interesting, but what, we're, what Ron's talking about are, are uh, called ICS courses, but uh, which is Institute Command or uh, Incident Command System. But uh, FEMA suggests it takes two to three hours to do one of them online. Experiences a lot of people get done with those faster than that, like any online thing as far as general and it's been probably a couple hours each. So. And I think that the, the importance of those, part of it is there's a lot of jargon around all this. And if you've seen any reference to any emergency preparedness or activity, this incident command system, ICS jargon is just thick. And these courses sort of help to kind of understand at least what they're talking about. So, I mean, it's good background information. Doesn't it? But, in a, but in a situation where you need it, it's helpful to have language. I've taken those classes, and it's helpful to have it because everyone yeah. knows what you're talking yes. about. Yes. It, it's a common, and it's the same everywhere. You could go to uh, Kansas and get involved in an emergency operations center. For example, they'd be speaking the same um, so it, it is standardized, which is a big benefit. The third area is um, encouraging emergency preparedness for business residents. And the fourth area is to prepare or participate in emergency preparedness exercises. Now, as I mentioned, our efforts uh, have really been on the first and the fourth one, ensure that all city employees pass the minimum FEMA course requirement. I mentioned the 100 and 200 class levels. We've also identified for um, other employees uh, the need to have uh, a higher level of training. Uh, for example, uh, my training has included the intermediate courses, the advanced courses, and then I participated on somewhere and was back at the national headquarters for firefighters and their 
advanced courses. So we've identified um, where each of the employees should be as far as their training. We'll continue with that and, uh, and uh, make sure all that training takes place. The fourth one has been in the uh, preparing for or having a simulated emergency uh, tabletop exercises. We have participated in um, two during the past year. Uh, the first one was uh, one that we just did in-house. It, um, it simulated, it was for just a small group of employees, and it simulated uh, a power outage. Uh, it was a regional power outage, and, and it lasted for about three days. And uh, the purpose of that was to uh, see how well we would be able to assess uh, uh, the damage, the priority, set the priorities. The second one that we participated in was the Cascadia Rising. This was a much more full-blown one. The whole state participated in it. Um, we worked very closely with uh, the county emergency preparedness. And in this case, we actually activated our emergency operations center. It allowed us to test uh, the notification system that we have. And, uh, and we learned a lot of what we did right. And we learned a lot of what we didn't do right. <coughs> And Mark has been taking that and incorporating it into our training programs and training process. Now, uh, for 2017, we have a significant event that's coming up, and that's the eclipse on August 21st. And so we have begun, we started about two months ago, uh, preparing for that in the same way we would uh, prepare for an emergency. And I'm just going to highlight a few things. Mark can add any details that he wants to jump in. Um, this is one that is a great exercise because, first of all, it's a real event. And second of all, it's going to require us to coordinate with other organizations. That's one area we have not done a lot with is in having exercises that require us to work with the hospital or work with the ambulance service or the fire department and so forth. Um, so we divided the, 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 the tasks into the, into the following categories. Public safety, traffic, water and sanitation, event planning, coordination with partners, and finances. Incidentally, uh, one of the very first things they teach you in the field of courses is that the most important person that you have is your finance person, because after you've done all of the rescues, that's the one that everybody looks to to make sure all the documentation's been done and work closely with FEMA. So we specifically wanted to make sure we had finance involved in this so that we could use that training. Um, we will be meeting on February 14th with several other organizations um, that have also begun this planning process to, to begin to coordinate our work together. Is that going to be here? Um, yes, it will be here. I, I believe it's in this room. In this room. Yeah. Uh, just a few things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, uh, first of all, on public safety, it is an all hands on deck uh, for that time period. All of our uh, police officers will be in active on duty. The city will be divided into two or three response areas. And dispatch will also be putting an extra dispatcher on duty as well during that time period. Um, um, Yes. Do we have volunteer police or special event police or citizen something? I don't believe we do. I know there's a citizen group, but I don't know how far along they are. <coughs> I don't know the answer. And that was your rule. Let me check. I don't, I don't know enough about that. But, but citywide, there are other organizations that I imagine will participate, like CERT. Um, and others of uh, that sort with, with traffic management or um, from you know the um, the eclipse is one day uh, so when you talk about a time frame are you talking 24 hours on the 21st or are you talking you're generally talking about uh, uh, really Friday through Tuesday because it's a Monday event. So we're talking about all weekends. See, part of what we have is that it's at the peak of our tourist season. Um, so we already have a good group here. 
and, uh, and this will add more. Now, interestingly enough, nobody knows for certain um, how many people, extra people, will actually come. Uh, we've heard estimates anywhere from 20,000 additional up to 50,000 additional people on in, the long, in this area of the coast. So, um, so the nice thing about not knowing that is that it is truly like an emergency. You, know, you never know just how big of an emergency you're going to have. Um, let's see. Um, yes. On the 14th, are the entities um, listed under coordination with partners? Yeah. Are they all invited? Um, Mark, can you answer how many and who has been invited? Um, let me look at that. But I, I think the answer is yes, hopefully. Okay. Um, coordination, I'm not sure which list you're looking at, but, but in this where under the coordination with partners, there's a list and definitely all, all of those. But it's meant to be open. I mean, you know, business, lodging, uh, uh, neighborhoods, fire, hospital, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, if that answers, I mean, a broad, broad-based community uh, involvement. Great. What time is that? Ten o'clock a.m. Traffic management is probably the key issue that we're going to be dealing with. And so there are several things that uh, we've already started taking uh, taking action towards under full traffic management and also under event planning. Um, the first is to try to identify the choke points, uh, the places where um, traffic can really be held up and try to make that run s more smoothly. For example, if we have the ability to turn people off, uh, say on West Devils Lake Road or on East Devils Lake Road to get to a location rather than coming right down through Highway 101. We want to make sure we have people that are directing traffic. Uh, another good point, uh, choke, good, another choke point is uh, where Sambo's is and we have the, uh, the pedestrian flashing light. Um, that can really, really choke up the traffic and so part of what we're proposing is to, if ODOT agrees, is to have that disabled and to put a crossing guard at that location. Um, uh, Roads in, uh, Logan Road is an area that can be a major choke point in that there's just simply no parking for if people are driving up that area. Uh, we, are, we are planning on putting up a traffic, a, a local traffic only just past the state park and use that as an area for people to turn around unless they're going up there either because they live there or they're staying in a vacation. Well, you're only talking Monday for that. That would sure. be for Monday. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Mark, uh, 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 Mark's biggest assignment on this has been to coordinate with all of the other uh, agencies and activities, and uh, it's been working with all of them on this. Uh, sanitation uh, is a big issue. Uh, we have reserved 40 porta potties. Uh, we are. We will be working over the next little while to identify exactly where those port bodies should go, um, including uh, uh, in our area of planning for the event, including the port potty, because that is looking for areas for parking, um, uh, planning, and. Um, ECB have been around through the town and looked at every parking area we have to identify those that can handle extra parking. We are, we are exploring, although we haven't firmly set up this up, as if there needs to be something as far as transportation. Um, in, in all likelihood, what we'll end up doing is in the parking is that we have several parking lots that have a half a dozen um, parking spaces. Those are not areas we really want to steer traffic to. We're really looking for the, the, work, the parking areas where we get the biggest bang for our buck. And, and on, on the topic of parking, I mean, the idea is, you know, we, we are putting a team uh, 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 planning in BCB. We got together and drove around town and, did, and, and documented the, the parking areas we have. Part of the, uh, the idea will be to, if we need to, to make sure we 
<coughs> tourists or people, visitors know where those spots are so that we can direct traffic a bit. Maybe not to, it, but to try to control it. We're also looking at advanced uh, advance information. Uh, BCB is putting together and already has their preliminary uh, uh, web page that is geared uh, specifically to this. We'll have maps and everything showing where people can go, uh, best places to try to find, to see the eclipse and so forth. Um, uh, let's see. Um, the, the initial information we have as far as occupancy rate that right now is that we're about 60% full. Um, we do believe what is happening is that our businesses are um, waiting to see what the maximum price they can get out of, uh, of um, the lodging industry, out of renting their rooms and hotels and so forth. Um, we do expect that to be completely filled up. And given that, Ron, I, I wonder if there any consideration of temporary uh, car camping or temporary camping areas? That's also, that's also part of what we're looking at is, is as we look at parking areas, uh, are there areas that people want to come in and camp? Uh, can they do so? And, you know, just what we're having to stay camp and so forth. So, yes, we're looking at that. Um, let's see. The, the basic message that we're really trying to give to people is come a day early, stay a day late. You know, uh, avoid the traffic. Enjoy all the other wonderful things besides being the first to see the eclipse that Lincoln City has to offer. And so that's the promotion that we're, we're really going to be uh, pushing uh, until the event is that uh, come early, stay late, find out all the wonderful things to do. You guys have all been to an event that you absolutely loved, and you couldn't get out of the parking lot for three hours, and you hated the event because of it. We want to make sure that by coming early, staying late, people are remembering this event as a number one and not a traffic problem. Well, that, that kind of gets to my question is, do we want people being here? Yes, I want them here Friday. Yes, I want them here Saturday. I want them here Sunday, spending and staying and all that. But for the event itself, would we be better served directing them out of town? Because, and, and don't spread this out beyond this room, but the likelihood of us having fog, <laughs> having a foggy day is pretty strong. Now, if we direct people, say, up to the villages, where we've got land that's up above the fog, we can see things. Can we get them up to the hills somewhere? Can we say, can we get ahead of this and say, here's your best viewing place, go up there? This is one area that I have found a little bit difficult. I'm going to let Mark address it, and that's how do we know what are the best areas? So I'm going to let Mark address that. <laughs> well, I, I think related to that, I don't know, I don't think it's, I mean, no matter what people are, I mean, one of the biggest, I, I think one of the biggest sort of fears would be if a lot of people come here because they want to see this on the coast, and then the weather report yeah. Uh, says this is going to be a lousy place, so suddenly 18 is a parking lot um, as people try to go wherever it is they think they're going. Right. Locally, I think we should consider, we can pretty much anticipate, I think anyway, if people are going to go to Rhodes End, D River, Taft, the beach areas, because people will always go to the beach areas. I think what we need to probably consider is can we direct them to other other areas? I know the golf course. When we're fogged in, if you go up to the you know, Lighthouse Square, you can see above it. But once you're down here, you're, you're stuck. So can we get ahead of that and say, okay, we're anticipating this, or even if we're not anticipating it, rather than clogging the beach, stopping on the side of the road, how about go up there and you know we can coordinate our services into one spot? Yeah, I mean, directing people to go anywhere. If, I, I think if we. It seems to me, anyway, if we're going to encourage people to go to specific places, if we can provide some sort of shuttle-type transportation, otherwise, man, <laughs> we could really have a mess. You know, otherwise it's better if they stay with us. Casino coordination with you on this? They're involved, definitely. Mark, we'd like to have some really interesting people in the site Cascade Inn. Well, I would, if, if I were... 
you know, looking and thinking where would be a neat place to do this. I mean, places like Cascade Head and the Knoll look pretty good. So you have have parking then or, or shuttle. That's or why I don't think we. I think we would agree. We don't want to direct people anywhere where there's not sufficient parking. That doesn't mean they won't end up there. And I think we still need to make provisions for the fact that they will end up there, yeah. but not advertise them. If that's yeah. so, Mark, I, I, I can understand why um, uh, people might think uh, the beach is the place to go because that's where they come to the city. That, that's all. In reality, I think the eclipse is at peak time at 10 a.m. in the morning in August, which is to me an Easter. Uh, it's not a surfing event. Yeah. So, you know, when I think of where I would go, um, it would be to the high school. I've got a big parking lot there. I've got a, a theater before there. I've got grandstands. I would hope there might even be bleachers and, and our porta potties and, and water. And it's east of 101. So I guarantee sunshine. I, I agree. I think that's. I think that's. I think that's one. Of, I just meant people go to the beach because they go to the beach. But, and I agree. But I think. I think the high school that type of area. If we can direct. Plus, it's a. It's a bit off the the beach. I don't really know the weather there that well. But I'm guessing maybe it might be out of the traditional fog the better um, because it's up. Yeah, every foot of elevation. But again, uh, I think, uh, and I'm hoping that the event and, and stuff, if we can point people to gather, like a stadium, like a, something, then that's an opportunity for more business vendors, uh, porta potties, parking, and everybody has a good time. That we can plan. There's no school that we contacted. The high school or school district to see a I don't believe they've been invited to come. Yeah, the no. I think they have they talk, agreed to come to the meeting. And then this brings to mind 4th of July at uh, Fort Vancouver and the immediate just freezing traffic and what a job the police did of keeping it moving. And you know, they said that ahead of time, saying, you're not going to park on the shoulder to watch this event. Or do we say, yeah, it's okay for a couple hours? You know, we need to address that. How do we keep the traffic moving at the height of the event? Yeah, it's it's going to be. I mean, with our with staffing levels, it's going to be. There, there are going to be limits to what can be enforced. Let me just say that. Can we have volunteers? Well, or stanchion. Doing <laughs> some things. Yes, right. doing something. And, and we can mark. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. we can mark places. I mean, we can take a little bit of control. But I'm saying. There will be a lot of people maybe parking places that we haven't even anticipated. Can we rent we have a truck like passenger trucks for the for the day of to move people for transportation? Right. Possibly. Without vacant lots. Well school buses as well. Well Columbia and then Hilltop has a big parking lot that nobody's there in contact with private private parking lots. You know, Lighthouse Square can be coordinated with you yes. on this day, and we will bust the people in and out or whatever and have. Like he has said, bleachers and that some places also, in addition to the high school. Yes. Well, I can't imagine Cold Stone and Jeff having parking lot full of people. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I, I think that it sort of brings up one of the areas uh, in the last discussion you were talking about giving you know, direction to Ron and, and staff on the direction. Part of it, the question here is how proactive do you want? I mean, one extreme is to say we do nothing and we hope it goes well. And I don't think any of us want to do that, but I'm saying that's one extreme. And the other is some, as matters, is doing their it's it's all event all the time they're really taking it on and then there's the whole middle ground but I think that that sort of uh, direction it, it comes into play in a lot of these areas because there is a budget associated with yeah, most that, of that that direction we will receive from you as we go through the budget process uh, because everything that we're talking doing we're talking about spending the city's funds 
and, and uh, some of it makes some sense, some of it, but there's going to be a limit. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this now, holding this meeting with the other organizations, is so that when we get to budget committee, we've already been able to identify what we think is a reasonable amount of spend. And, and maybe you mentioned already, and I missed it. Will we be hearing about DCP is going to promote it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right okay. tonight. Um, are you ready to answer that question on what you're doing to promote it, Ted? Oh, sure. <laughs> Come on up. I don't think 40 toilets is enough to have 20,000 extra people. You think it is or is not? <laughs> Interestingly enough, we'll find it hard to come by. <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> 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 you just introduce yourself. 40. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 20 My name's uh, Ed Drystone. I'm with the uh, Visitor and Convention Bureau. Thank you. And I'm sorry, did you want to? No. Yeah. 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 Yes, enough. I can it, it, the show is up. It hasn't been properly. What's the latest? It's, uh, it's uh, LakenCityEclipse.com. <laughs> yeah, we've uh, we've established a, a mini website, and uh, the idea is for that to be the clearinghouse of all the information we have on the eclipse. Uh, we're working with the uh, casino. They're going to be having an event at the casino. Uh, they're going to. Position, position themselves as the place to go to get the, uh, the glasses. The outlet mall is also going to be doing a promotion around distribution of the Eclipse glasses. Uh, so we'll be working with them. And it'll be the site with maps, suggested viewing areas, uh, where the best chance is for parking. We're probably going to tie in a, uh, a Twitter handle uh, so you can get as best we can do it, real-time updates on where to go, what to avoid, that type of thing. Um, when you say marketing the event, I think it's it's more like managing the event. You know, we're going to be beyond capacity, and we need to be able to uh, direct people to where we have capacity, to steer them away from places that are already overcrowded. Um, We'll be working very closely with uh, with Mark and uh, the rest of the team to get the appropriate information out to the folks that are here for the Eclipse. Um, in terms of marketing it as a, a big event and trying to get even more people to come here, that scares me just a little bit, and that's, that's not quite the approach we're going to take. Uh, it, it's more of a uh, sharing of information and as best we can make sure that they have a pleasant experience when, they, when they're here. The first landfall in continental United States is, this will be the first place is it happens. Fogarty Creek. I don't think we have to advertise people to come. I think people will look up. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm only asking because usually we want them to stay in Newport. We want them to stay here. Just roll those dice and go, well, they'll come here. Well, but maybe we'll they'll populate your board. I understand, but I just want to know, you know are, are you going to be doing any TV news? Uh, I'm sure we're taking interviews. But more, so. Well, I, I, I think whether, whether Ed and group actively market or not, I'm imagining that news media are going to be probing around this, and they will have plenty of opportunities yeah, we'll, to discuss it. Yeah, we're going to be yeah. working with, uh, we have discussions right now with Travel Oregon to see if uh, we could host a TV crew down here. I would I'll personally make my house available to CNN or MSNBC or Fox or anyone else who wants to have the reporter here for the first landfall. Uh, one of the big opportunities is to let the world know that there is a Lincoln City and that we are on the coast, and that that is an opportunity we're going to pursue. Uh, but the vision of that is much more long-term than just the eclipse itself. It's to help build awareness of us as a, a beachside vacation destination. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a tremendous danger that we're going to lose room nights for the eclipse to Newport, unless the room rates here go above Four thousand dollars. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> yep. I'm just worried about capacity, so that it will be at over capacity. So I worry about sewer, water, mm -hmm. and restaurants. Are we inviting a card type of uh, extra places for people to find? Okay. 
think we're going to have that many people involved. And you like put cards type yes. thing. Well, it's been discussed. I don't think. I'm going to get some hot dogs. <laughs> well, carts are allowed, just not motorized vehicles. Um, it just gives you get a license from the city, which is like only 35 bucks. And then if you're selling perishables, you have to get a, a permit from the county. I can tell you one thing that our staff has discussed that's along these lines, and that's that we don't really want to do anything that puts us in competition with the private enterprise. For example, we are not going to be selling or giving away the glasses because people have already stepped up to do that and we do not want to put ourselves in competition with private enterprises. Do we have a budget set aside for safety or signs, you know, hey, do not look into the sun uh, and all that dumb stuff. Well, we have to be coming to you as, uh, as part of the bar budget for next year. So most of the costs that access. Like most of the costs that will be associated with this are going to be in your next year. I like that page, by the way. Sewer and water. Pardon me? Capacity, sewer and water. Well, part of it, I mentioned all hands on deck for police. It's the same for water and sewer. Can, can we have another extra amount of garbage cans throughout the city? Um, I think we seven. I don't know if there was a number we talked about, not just cans, but dumpsters. dumpsters. Right, <laughs> not recycling, you know, how it be appropriate to yeah. the street. Yeah. <clears throat> I definitely. In, in the area. You know, it's, it's a question, especially if we're directing traffic, you know, we know where people are going to be, um, can make provisions for that. But yeah, I think we have to recognize it's, it's we're talking dumpsters. <laughs> But as I mentioned, uh, the purpose of this is to help us on our skills as it pertains to emergency. There's very similar there are similarities between this and an emergency. Um, the biggest difference is that uh, we know this one's coming, and we can prepare for it adequately. Hoping that the training and the employees will be useful in case of a real emergency uh, comes along. It's interesting to know that was uh, one of our employees. I don't remember which one it was. I was mentioning in all the cities that I've worked in, we've had to activate an emergency operations center. Every one of them has had something. Hurricane, flood, uh, house exploding. Uh, you know, while we were waiting for the big one, there's going to be a lot of little ones that come up in the county. Some natural disasters or some natural disasters. And along those lines, just to, a lot of what we've talked about here is really event management, managing the event. Then we have the subtext of what if something big happens while we've got this extra crowd. I mean, we haven't, it's hard enough to imagine what we do with our normal summer crowd, but so that's a subtext that will run through this also, I think, as we have for discussions. And and the, uh, one, one other thing with the website, keep in mind that's a collaborative effort. That isn't coming just from the VCB. So if you come across information, if you hear about someone in town who's doing something, if you have a piece of information that belongs on that site, don't be shy to give us a call and let us know about it. And are we doing any work with uh, Eco Bay or Newport? We haven't got any other cities and cities cities. county organizations to come <coughs> on the 14th. And the county, the, the, the county had a meeting, there was a county-wide meeting in uh, December, and there will be another coming up soon, I think it's going, I'm not sure, soon, partially to do that. But I think the various, I think that like the fire departments, for example, I think are already talking among themselves, police, sheriff, or, because there will be you know, they'll be meshing in a way that maybe isn't the norm. And again, it's going to be all hands on deck. That's going to be pretty clear for all these organizations. I'm just thinking about something, too. Um, so, lift the load a little bit because we get a lot of people here. Is that maybe on the website, we have to anticipate people are coming because they will be. So, maybe just say, bring your picnic basket, your full picnic basket, bring your bottle of water.
Okay. Was that the end of that then, Ron? It is. Okay. We're at oh, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. I still have one more thing. This is beyond uh, the eclipse, but on emergency preparedness. Uh, I'll beat my drum. <laughs> For emergency preparedness, um, number one, and we can use this as our time frame um, to get the tsunami evacuation wayfinding signs up, and that they actually direct you somewhere. Yeah, that's on our list. I think it's on, it's, it's just a one line on, on Ron's kind of wayfinding of okay. things. I think some terminology. Okay. Yeah. But um, some areas are better than others. Rose End is not because it wasn't part of the city when this was initially. No, excuse, that's years <laughs> no, I, no, it's a, just a statement of fact. I'm just saying it's a statement of what you see in the first hand. But yes, um, I think that has to be done before we have even more people. Yes. And also my, my other drumbeat is for um, catches in each geographic neighborhood. And that, the, to answer your question before you ask it, is that we don't have to um, maintain it or put, put um, supplies in it, but that would be for the neighborhoods to coordinate. Are you talking survival caches? Yeah. So we can... So, you know, the city does have land, and we do trades or whatever, and we can get lots. Is Sioux Grave still handling that? We, we bought, uh, we went together, the county commissioners have, or had some years, and, and started again, a uh, uh, grant, and we went together with the fire department and the school district to buy uh, caches and Taft and Ocean Lake and so and they're essentially big containers with basic supplies, not food so much because uh, well, you know, there's an issue, but with other supplies, so it all knows the lines. A couple hours down the road, um, Canyon Beach has, they go through theirs, I think, once a year. Right. They right. replenish their water. Yeah, they start taking care of that here, don't they? And they go to the drill bed and check the water and the tents. Yeah. Uh, it's basically just water. It's not so much food supplies. Yes, yeah, so they they pull down the tents, I remember, and check them and yeah, catch yeah. them. Okay. Um, well, good. If you guys are getting ready to move on to the next one, well, that's be, I'm going to say it's uh, seven. Does anyone want to get up and get a beverage? Use the uh, restroom. Okay. Okay. Bye. Jump into the rest of this.
picking it up for the broadcast of it, but we don't have individual mics in front of us to broadcast it to the audience. So if you can't hear, wave your arm and let us know so, uh, so we know that you're not picking it up. Okay, our next is uh, Visitors and Convention Bureau. Uh, over the past two years, much has changed with the Visitors and Conventions Convention Bureau um, in the way we are marketing ourselves, in the way we are looking at ourselves, the type of activities that we we do, as so much so that uh, I have talked with Ed and said, is it time for us to change the name? We don't have a convention center, and we don't operate a convention center. Is there a name that would be more um, apropos to what we actually do, such as Travel Lincoln City? Uh, so that's one that, as we go through this presentation, think about it. Um, tr there's Travel Oregon that ties us in with the state, but I threw it up there because I couldn't think of any other name to use. Uh, but anyways, that's one of the questions, and as we go through tonight, we'll talk about some of the changes that we have made and how that's, uh, and how that's affected our operation. The mission of the uh, Visitors and Convention Bureau is, uh, uh, is the vision is a vibrant and prosperous Lincoln City as the preferred beach destination on the Oregon coast. And the mission is to inspire travel, stimulate economic growth, and steward brand identity through destination management, tourism, promotion, and visitor experience. All that we have been doing over the last two years, we hope, has been geared to accomplishing these two things. Uh, our focus in our branding, our advertising, our media planning, public relations, social media, group tours, meetings and conventions, events, information services, all have been, we hope, to try to accomplish these purposes. And so what I wanted to do tonight was just um, use a few things that we have done to give you an idea of the direction that we're going, some things that we've cast off, and some things that we are pursuing on, again, on how we think it fits this. Um, okay. Um, the VCB has fo focused its marketing plan where it can get the biggest bang for the buck. The two objectives we mentioned for advertising are to inspire potential guests to visit Lincoln City and establish and reinforce the Seven Miles of Smiles campaign. Now, with that, um, we are getting ready to run some new TV spots. We've created uh, three new 30-second TV spots and then adapted them to uh, three 15-second TV spots. Um, and I wanted to play these for you, right? Now, the resolution on this isn't that great. If you can see it here, it's better. It's better on the two TVs. It's not so great. But uh, but it, it we, we're also going to have a premiere night at the Bijou, so we can do it on a big screen. When you see when you say TV spots, you're talking about for television. About I understand. Yeah, concept. <laughs> but this will be for the This will be for the valley. Uh, this will be for uh, Portland, which also covers the valley. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
and making city working, there's miles to explore. Seven miles to be exact. Seven miles of ocean breezes. Seven miles of rhythmic waves. Seven miles of soft standing beach. Come, find your smile. Only in Lincoln City. I'm just going to let them play in the first second, 15 seconds there. They're similar, but a little bit different for each other. Ocean breezes. Rhythmic waves. Seven miles of sandy beach. Come find your smile. Only in Lincoln City, Oregon. Book your getaway today. In Lincoln City, Oregon, there's miles to explore. Seven miles to be exact. Seven miles of hidden treasure. Seven miles of alluring adventure. Seven miles of extraordinary discovery. Come, find your smile. Only in Lincoln City. Book your getaway today. Hidden treasure, alluring adventure, seven miles of extraordinary discovery. Come find your smile. Only in Lincoln City, Oregon. Book your getaway today. In Lincoln City, Oregon, there's miles to explore. Seven miles to be exact. Seven miles of new fun fun. Seven miles of boundless possibility. Seven miles of magic family moments. Come, find your smile. Only in Lincoln City. Book your getaway today. You found fun, boundless possibility. Seven miles of magic family moments. Come find your smile. Only in Lincoln City, Oregon. Book your getaway today. That feels great. I just love the, especially on a Bose speaker, because it gets that bass. Is there a way to go to the first one? I wanted to stop it at one point. I'll call her out when I need to stop. In Lincoln City, Oregon, there's miles to explore. Seven miles to be exact. Not that one. Seven miles of ocean breezes. Seven miles of rhythmic waves. There. Seven miles. Right back there. That's what I was talking about with the fog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what we're going to look at. And, and you saw the top there. You yep. can see right over the top of it. So be prepared. So, so as I mentioned, All of our advertising, all of our marketing has been geared towards <coughs> accomplishing uh, this mission and this vision. A uh, big part of this has been the creation of the VCB for a very elaborate marketing plan looking at when people are coming, why they're coming, and where they're coming from, and then trying to gear that marketing plan towards, uh, towards that kind of, to that end. Okay? Um, now, uh, another thing that we have, the, when, when Ed and I first started working here, um, there was a lot of discussion uh, about the shoulder seasons. Okay, how do we bring up the shoulder seasons, uh, uh, the, the off season, and, and, and increase that? Well, one of the discussions that we began having and talking, and first of all, interestingly enough, I'm, Never heard a businessman yet who said, back off on the summer um, and focus the city's entire attention on fall and the winter. But uh, one of the things that we began asking ourselves and is, that, um, is it easier to get people to come here when they're already thinking about going on vacation than to come here when they're not thinking about going on vacation? Okay, does that make sense? And so what we've looked at doing, and we're starting to see some success at this, is beginning at our peak season and expanding it out. And so one of the things that I wanted to show you on this is um, this graph. Um, this, 
This says TRT, it's actually not TRT, it's the gross room rate okay, from which the TRT comes off of. Um, you can see that every year since 2011, the pattern has been the same. You have a peak in uh, spring break, you have a peak, the highest point in August, and then it drops back down. Now, there's two things that are significant about this. The first is, is that you can see that each year it's been better. Okay, overall, at every point, it's been better. But the thing that's the most telling is this point right here, July. You can see that for those four years, the pattern was the same. There was, there was a big jump from here, and a little bit, and then a peak. This last year, or the year before and last year, you see that flatten out. So for this year, our July was as good as our August. Okay? Uh, again, the idea behind that, and that's something we hope to be able to continue and stretch it out even farther, is marketing towards when people are already thinking about vacation and then going out <coughs> beyond that. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. I, going back through the old records and, and some of the, uh, the direction the VCB was given was don't advertise in June because we don't want the folks here then. We're already too full. Uh, it doesn't work that way. We're running a lot of media right now because right now through March is when people make their plans for the summer. So the advertising that we're doing uh, late winter, early spring is going to impact us in June, July, August. If you advertise in June, those folks show up in September. So we're timing our message, we're timing when we do things to impact the summer season when uh, mom, dad, and the kids are here because the weather's great and, the, uh, and school's out. <clears throat> Once the kids go back to school, that's when we get the, uh, the empty nesters and uh, the folks who, uh, who don't have kids in the household who don't want to deal with the kids and want to come here and have a, a kind of a different experience. So we're tailoring timing and message to hit those various segments. But, you know, some of the, uh, some of the thinking I found in the files, I wish life was that easy and it worked that way, but it's, it's not exactly how it works in terms of timing. One of the things that we did last year, and I think everybody's familiar with it, but I'll just mention briefly, is the booking uh, program that we added to our web page. Uh, we have found that that has been very successful. Uh, it's a service that we provide for free to all of our lodging, uh, our lodging uh, uh, businesses, and uh, it has quite frankly exceeded our expectations. Um, and uh, and it has been able to track um, how many people have gone from our web page to the booking engine of a business. Uh, and he can track it for each business, and uh, so um, we're, we're very proud of that. But let me explain the concept behind it a little bit, and it's it's really more customer service and hospitality than it is uh, trying to gear the website to make a buck. Not that that's a bad thing, but. If you think about the website the way it used to be, you'd go on it, you'd click on Logic and add Lodging, and there would be an alphabetical list of hotels. You'd go through that one by one, trying to see, A, do I want to stay there? And B, once I'm on their website, do they have a room available? Try that in the summer, and the answer was often, no, there's no room available. So I'll check another one, I'll check another one, I'll check another one, I give up, I'm gone. What we put in its place is really us being hospitable. You know, it isn't, uh, here's the hotel, it's lots of luck, hope you find one. It's, uh, we'll, we'll do it for you. you. When you hit that button on our search engine with the dates put in, it only brings up available room inventory. We've shown you where the hotels are that have a room where you can stay. And that in and unto itself is just uh, head and shoulders above where we were before. Uh, and if you're interested in that hotel, you can click on it, go in, and, and actually purchase. So we've taken innumerable steps out of the process. We're requir requiring our guests to jump through far fewer hoops and hurdles, and we're being a far better host. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, when you go over and look at the dollars and cents of it, you can, 
And if, if anybody has any, any specific questions on this, I'll, I'll bring in my lifeline. Scott's back here. But uh, if you're a hotel property, you can do a thing with a tracking pixel through Google, tell that that person came into your site and, and you know whether or not they booked. Uh, there's a VRD management company in town here who's done that, and directly from our website, uh, they've seen over $10,000 worth of business so far. Uh, the uh, casino is telling us that we suddenly became their second highest referral site. They couldn't figure it out for a, a minute, and it turns out it's our poking engine pushing people over to the, over to the uh, casino website. I wish I had a clearer picture of the whole thing. We, uh, we lose sight of them once they get into the, the hotel's website. We can, we can track out up until then, and then they kind of vanish. And it has to happen from the other end to get the, uh, the financial picture. But just from that one property that was able to tell us, that's almost what we paid for the service. So anything above that is, is just gravy. But it, it really shifts what we're all about. You know, uh, instead of just here's a bunch of information, lots of luck on planning your vacation, we become a, t a tool that helps them plan their vacation. And we're going to be looking for more and more ways to do that. <clears throat> Thank you, by the way. It's wonderful what you do. Uh, looking at that graph that you have, uh, I hope I'm not comparing apples to oranges, uh, but my guess is probably your capacity, uh, peak capacity from the red line in August that goes gently up, and you can see the July green line that goes up over it. I would suggest that that red mark may represent the uh, town at full capacity and the growth there in the, in the end of the green wasn't necessarily more tourists, but the hotels uh, yeah. raising their 80 for, uh, average room rate, and that's the reason for that gap. Well, I think you can see that year to year, where if you look at the difference between the, the spring break peak and the summer peak, that gets exaggerated as you go through the years. And that can't all be just more hotel rooms. I think you're absolutely right. When we when we add business and pressure to that peak season, that's ADR going up. That's average daily rate. Yeah, and I would be curious as on the math that would be involved uh, to to tell us just how much more profitable is that that little that little bit of green over that red that gap in there. Mm -hmm. That's pure profit. Yeah, and how that compares going after that with your advertising, because I don't think the advertising is more expensive in the summer. Um, yeah, but, but if you advertise in the summer, you're impacting the fall. That's right. No, no, yeah. but I'm saying just no, if you're trying, I don't, right now we're struggling with $40 rooms, you know, and all the advertising in the world probably won't, you know, help that much except for the weekends where you're actually seeing some more volume again. It's just, just another uh, that was it. And also, I'd be curious to find out, as well as why they are coming, I would be very curious to find out why they aren't coming, because there are people that have come here and won't come back, and I don't know why. <coughs> so, yeah. Nice job, here. Thank you. Yeah, I see it as charging more, you know, without how many more rooms you have, or the, the number of people. You know, so there's the number of available rooms, the percentage of that, and then the, the rented rooms. This just says well, they're making more money. I think we saw the ADR. I don't know if we have it in here or not, but uh, and I'll, I'll send you the chart. There's uh, there's a chart that we plotted out from uh, Smith Travel Research for Lincoln City, and it shows occupancy and average daily rate, and they track right along with each other. So the more you can get the occupancy up, the more the rooms are worth. Yep. And that, by the way, those rooms going up are a free ride for the city because when you're advertising those rooms at $40 a night, you have two, uh, many, many cars coming in there where there's no expense to the other. It's pure gravy. And there's not the extra vehicles coming that clog up the, the highway. It's, if we want to try to get something, it's got to be that buttermilk that they've got on top. Any other questions? 
Okay, so another example of uh, some changes that we have made that have really been to the, to, in our events. Okay. It's interesting to note, uh, just a few days ago, as Ann and I were talking about the events, we actually haven't decreased any events, the, number, the total number of events we've had in the city. Uh, maybe we, we might have even gone up a little bit higher. What we've done, though, is that we've changed the, um, the, the ownership and the management of the events. Okay. Um, let me give you just uh, two good examples, uh, 4th of July and the Kite Festival. Those are events that the city sponsors. We pay for it, we run it, um, and, uh, and we operate it. Um, the events that I've listed up here um, are a combination of other events in which the city is not actually the ownership, does not actually have ownership of the event. Uh, we, we were, in, sen in a sense, incubators for it. Uh, uh, some people had some wonderful ideas. Um, I'll use the Chowder and Brew Fest as an example. The city held a, a, a Chowder Fest. Okay? It was a good event. Um, the Chamber of Commerce held the Brew Fest, part, um, October mm -hmm. Brew Fest. It was a good event. Okay? Um, we, we, we had the idea of combining those into one chowder and brew fest, and that the ownership of it is with, is with the chamber and the other sponsors, and there were five or six other sponsors that were involved with it. Over time, our role in those will begin to diminish. So after three to four years, we'll always have somebody involved, but it will be the minimal amount of time that the city has to invest in it, and it will be run and operated by uh, the different sponsors and groups. Tour to Die For was the same way. Cruise to the Coast uh, was the same way. And the latest one that we have coming up is the recreation of the Pixie Fest, where again, our, initially, we have quite a bit of involvement in it, but over time, our, um, our uh, activities with it will diminish as the sponsors uh, take it over. Now, for any event, especially those that require fundraising. But you know you're successful if you're fundraising for the next year, not the year coming up. You've got enough in the bank to handle 2017. I'm actually fundraising for 2018. That way, um, uh, you know, that's what we hope we can get to. On the other hand, uh, one of the tough things for the government to do is to stop doing things. Okay, there people get Small groups get ownership of ideas. It's very difficult for a government to stop doing things. If any one of these events reached a point where it really was not profitable for, uh, for, for it to be carried on, then built into that mechanism is the way for it to stop. And, uh, and, and, it sh and if, it, if it can't carry itself, it should stop. And so we're really thrilled with that idea where we're still having the events and you're seeing, and you've seen some of these in that off season that we talked about. We're still having these events, but it's shifting the responsibility of carrying those events to other organizations in the city. And I think that almost translates to our discussion of homeless. Like, you know, it's just that <laughs> very similar. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and you know, Ron said in three or four years, uh, what we're finding out is more like one year. Uh, Chowder and Brewfest. Uh, Chamber of Commerce owns that, and I'll go to meetings and sit there and offer to help with some promotion and whatnot. They're running the show, and operationally, we're not going to have a thing to do with it. And uh, they've already got folks lined up. And yes, oh, I thought that was you tapping your foot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, Tory Dive Force the same way. By the time we got to the second weekend, all the city folks were standing there like this, and the three nonprofits were running the show. <laughs> and we had the recap meeting where they were talking about what we need to do next year. We contributed nothing, and they took the reins. So the idea that we're an incubator and we can hand off is, is actually been working much better than, than we suspected going in. Who owns the names? Who owns the names? Who owns the names? The names? The, uh, 
No, any of his copies. Yeah, Tour to Die for, <coughs> excuse me, is owned by the North Lincoln County Historical Museum as the lead partner. Uh, Chowder and Brew Fest is owned by the Chamber. And uh, Pixie Fest, Pixie Kitchen, and Pixie Land, all three are owned by the Kiwanis Club. Right. And speaking of Pixie Fest, you see the uh, little guy driving? That's what our float's going to look like. <laughs> And uh, in the Portland Parade, and we're missing. I need to. I need the name of a driver and their driver's license to complete the application. So we, we need to elect a sea captain willing to wear pixie ears and try to steer a golf cart with a ship's wheel. Uh, Richard, you've already got the gear. <laughs> the next thing that was our mini float. You say for the yeah, yeah this is the mini float. We, uh, we 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 already bought the golf cart that should be down here in town in a week or two. And uh, the uh, guys in the maintenance shop are going to go at it with a sawzall. We're, we're going to convert it to where you drive it, standing up with a ship's wheel. And then uh, you go to Kip's property. He's got two whaleboat rides from Pixie, uh, Pixie Land there. We're going to use one of them as a template and uh, scale it up to where it's 14 feet long and, I forget, 7 feet wide. Uh, and we're going to do a paper mache or whatever body that we'll glue the seats to to make it eligible for the parade. Uh, we're hoping to have two mermaids on the back and six walk around characters to go with it. Okay. And are you getting little... some video of this in the process? Oh, yeah, we will. Okay, that'd be very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mayor Williams was actually the one who introduced us to the parade uh, um, sponsors and uh, administrators, and we've been having a lot of fun with it ever since. May, may I point out that Mayor Williams also has a beard and would make a <laughs> <laughs> captain? I don't care. All I, want is to, all I want is to crush Sherwood. That's all <laughs> I care about. Uh, won the last two years, and it's time they moved. The next thing we wanted to talk about was the Culinary Center. Uh, an opportunity presented itself. Um, um, we lost a really good employee, Sharon Weiss. She took a, a, a wonderful opportunity back in Ohio uh, uh, to further her career, and it gave us an opportunity to reevaluate the Culinary Center and the shows and everything else that, that we do. And there's a couple things that has come out of that that I wanted to mention tonight. And the first one is how we do the, uh, the cooking shows. In order to really illustrate this, I want to show you a couple of clips. Okay. These are two of my favorite, favorite cooking shows. You guys all know who Rachel Ray is? And you know who Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives is? Okay. And this first one is of Rachel Ray and a program that she did um, about making chili cheesesteaks. Smoking hot in the studio today. I've got my buddy Danny Drop sitting in the kitchen. Down there. He's waiting for my version of Philly cheesesteak season 2016-17. So this is the proper cut to use for a proper well, she goes Philly through that, I'm gonna highlight This is things. boneless ribeye. You'll notice that her guest is just part of the audience. There's nothing he's cold, going to do until he's supposed to eat it. Grill. And the entire show and focuses on like Rachel Ray, side. who is cooking. Okay? So it's nice and so to she's doing office. all of the work. She's <laughs> doing all of the this is very much go. of what our and program has done like under Sharon. It's a good program that's worked and well. But we look at it in a different way on how to, on how to uh, change it. On top. I'm using our oven roast tomatoes. Yeah, I'm going to switch off from here on this one. Yeah, that we cooked up with you. And the next, uh, the next clip that I wanted to show you is from Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. This is the famous Taps. Taps. Look at that. You come to Baltimore, this is what you better see. That you don't need to stop it. It's our favorite thing to eat. We're not going to be anywhere else. One meeting or rare being that a great statement. You're not going to get any better from nowhere else. Okay? Done the way you want. The difference in each of the shows is that I can read this. He's the star. He's not going to do anything. Okay? 
to start a case with you, Mr. Bob and Donna Crater got married. As a wedding gift, my father gave me this little shack. For lawn tools or what was the reason? He said he was going to treat the rest of the home. And not just if it was a heat, but he's telling the story of the rest of the home. He was going to treat the rest of the home. 21 years ago, the dad gave him a gift, a shack, and they returned it. And they started making this brisket, and now it's in the dining room. Is this the best food we've bought? Now this is the most beautiful thing we want to start the back. So what we are, so what we are looking at doing is how do you combine those two formats? Uh, we love the idea people are coming to Lincoln City to watch our show, but we really don't want people to come to watch our show. That's only 24 people. What we want is people to come and go to the restaurants that are in town. Okay. So the format that we've been working on um, is that um, instead of having our chef doing the cooking, our chef will be featuring the chefs of the other restaurants. And we're looking at all of the restaurants to do this. High end, low end, doesn't really matter and also telling the story of those restaurants. So when people, and then using those shows to make advertising clips and everything else, so when people are looking at going to vacation, they're not looking and saying, oh, let's go to the culinary show because they're having a Greek class. They're saying, well, shoot, Jay's has the best fish and chips that I can get. Or, ooh, let's go to uh, Bay House, or let's go to McMinimums, or any of the other restaurants that we have. So instead of using our culinary center as a as a one marketing tool, it now becomes a marketing tool for all of the restaurants that are in town. Do you want to add on to that? Yeah, our, our old pitch was come to Lincoln City and uh, experience the master chef at the culinary center, period. What we want to do is to not really have a master chef anymore, to uh, use the culinary center to showcase the chefs of Lincoln City and talk about the, uh, the culinary scene in Lincoln City. And to Ron's point, the other problem we've always had is we can touch 24 people at a time when we do a demo. If it's, a, if it's back in the kitchen and it's hands-on, it's 12 people at a time. It's hard to move the needle with 24 people at a time. But if we take what I think is probably two-thirds of a TV set anyway, the show stage we have there, and learn how to shoot, edit, and produce video out of there, that we can feed onto YouTube, onto our website, embed in our emails, put up on Facebook. Um, I think we can start to build an audience with video, which we need to learn how to do anyway, and also start to brand that food scene in Lincoln City. Uh, none of this is going to be focused on the culinary center per se. It's going to be focused on the food you can get in Lincoln City and some of the incredible people we have here to make the food scene happen. That's the goal. We're going to be filming a, uh, a pilot episode uh, that probably won't ever see air because I'm too cheap to pay for all the lighting and everything right off the bat. But we're going to do a food concept video to learn how to do it, make all of our mistakes there. And uh, once we have that down pat, then we'll spend the money to do the lighting and, and some of the other things we need to do and start to regularly come up with uh, video programming out of the culinary center that tells people why they need to come here and eat. Yes. So is the videoing and the lights and camera and action all that, is that, will that be done by your staff? No. Then you have to hire No. It's, well, yeah, I'm, 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 you know, Scott's very talented, don't get sorry. me wrong. But uh, it's only it's, it's only going to be as good as the, the person directing it and the person editing it and the person behind the camera. Now, one of the suggestions we had had was, why can't this be an opportunity for the kids at Taft High School or you know some of the other schools here? Once we learn how to do it, and once we're starting to put out a quality product, you know, one of the other missions of the Culinary Center is to be an educational institution. And just a quick side note on that: two of the kids going through the uh, program right now from Career Tech just got hired at uh, Blackfish Cafe. Rob Pounding taught a class and went, those two are good, and he snapped them right up. Uh, what I want to do is to come up with a shadowing program. 
to where once we get this thing going, we give kids the opportunity to work with the cameraman, shadow the uh, producer, that type of thing. Uh, what I'd like to do after that, and this would be primarily for Channel 4, uh, would be get the kids trained, let them do their own show, and probably do it through Samaritan Hospital with a nutritionist uh, doing shows on how to eat healthy on a budget, that type of thing. So we, we've got all this kind of mapped out, uh, but we really want to take it carefully one step at a time so we put out a quality product. That's yeah, exciting. Yeah, you know, one thing that like, I've always thought we should be doing up there is teaching people how to prepare meals who yeah. don't know how to prepare meals. Yeah. You know, it comes, stems from our frustration of being in line behind someone who's maybe using a work card or a trail card mm -hmm. and, you know, God bless them, they need food, but I'm looking at their choices. And I'm like, wow, I think I can help you do a little better. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know, have somewhere we can say, we're going to have a class. Yeah. We'll teach you how to prepare a healthy meal for your family. I have a request for how to use what kind of knives for what kind of thing. Okay. Wait. It's not basic for me. Yeah, basic knives. <laughs> I personally have no idea, but I know someone who does. And that's good news, bad news, because now we'll expose all of our local secrets. <laughs> And that's, the whole world that's, will know. That's not, that's not up to me. If they expose their own secrets, it's, it's, uh, it's oh, all it's me. <laughs> so, uh, that's, those are just examples of the directions that we're trying to go with the, uh, with, uh, with the VCB soon to be called something else, if you're okay with that. Um, and do you have any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm just happy I, I love that you start most of your sentences with, but I'm too cheap to. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me very happy. And, and you've been a great steward of the taxpayers' money, and I appreciate that. Well, um, you know, it's it's given us the opportunity to uh, to do a lot of things. Um, you know, when, when, whenever you're doing marketing, uh, I, was, I was brought up in the business uh, with the understanding that there's the thing called the effective frequency model, where the first time you hear it, it just goes right by you. The second time, maybe it registers a little bit, but it's not until that third time you heard the message that you're moved to action. And if we do a little here, a little there, a little over here, we're not talking to anyone about anything. And if, if you look at what, what we have, we're focused really like a laser on Portland uh, and, and also on the Valley and not too much else. And the whole idea is to concentrate those resources on that we have. So they're here in Lincoln City, Lincoln City, and then third Lincoln City, maybe I'll go on vacation there. So, you know, it's, it's that type of thing that the, you've all given me the ability to do and a, a a green light to, to go ahead. You know, we, we trimmed a lot, we focused a lot, and I think we're going to see some big results from it. And I appreciate that you're, you know, using the technology today, you know, YouTube and Facebook Live and things like that to spread the word. Speaking of cheap, should we talk about the reserve? I think Council I'm going to say that for the budget. Okay. And um, you, you talked about, or Ron talked about these four or five events that have grown. Mm -hmm. There's others, but you're uh, are you changing the or thinking about changing the grant program that helps uh, incubate uh, new events? So no, we I, I you just that was, it was it was it uh, was it's it's been changed, and the the BCC committee was working on it well before I got here. Uh, but it's going to be a once a year program now, and they uh, they just wrapped up a round where we handed out one hundred and eighty thousand dollars to uh, various folks here in town. And, uh, you know, with that, uh, we're going to have a lot of events and, more importantly, a lot of well-funded events that have the wherewithal to tell people from Portland and Salem, come on in. Um, a lot of them are timed where we have a big problem with people coming in from Salem, enjoying the beach, turning around and going home because there's so much daylight here in the, in the summer that there's no need to stay overnight. Well, if we can get them in for an event like Chowder and Brew Fest or a Tour to Die For or Pixie Fest or, or any of that, then uh, they're going to have to stay overnight. You know, they're not going to have the luxury of all that daylight to drive home because they've been having too much fun for too late. Uh, 
you know, things like Pixie Fest, the way it's timed, it's going to be our, our grand opening to the summer. Uh, and we're going to be presenting all these wonderful childhood memories, inviting families to come down with their kids to share what they had uh, when they were their kid's age. So, you know, it's it's all, all working. And the beauty of it is I don't have to run any of it. My department doesn't have to run any of it. You know, we'll, we'll be involved fairly heavy the first year, but after that, as long as it's popular and profitable and, um, you know, it'll, it'll run by itself. Uh, Chowder Fest, none of us knew what that thing was until the day of the event. We're standing around looking at it, and you could see the light bulbs going off like, oh, okay, this is what it is. And it became very clear what we did right, what we did wrong, and how the thing needs to be run. And at that point, correct me if I'm wrong, the chamber's very comfortable around it. And then we're seeing that with, with all the stuff that we're doing, which is great. But I'm, I'm just happy to hear that we're you know, still throwing out uh, yep. either our expertise, the mm -hmm. marketing, uh, helping nonprofits or groups yep. to uh, to yeah. you know, grow their events so that we might, you know, they might become one of the. And it's you know, it's, it's best when you're doing what you know how to do. Um, you know, it, it, we we did our best to make Tour to Die for look professional with a nice logo and graphics and creative. Uh, we we just did the same thing with Antique Week where we, we finally got rid of that. I shouldn't say it's an ugly logo because with my luck, there's somebody sitting here at the table who knows someone who did it. But the, we're just trying to, to <laughs> elevate. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> But, but you know, you want to make it look like something you want to go to that's well run and organized and fun. And, and that's what I know how to do. You, you want me running around the clipboard telling somebody where the stage goes and when to unload the porta potties? That would be a supremely bad idea. Um, but there's other folks that know how to do that. Uh, with, with Tour to Dive or with uh, Chowder Fest, the casino got involved with their department that handles booking all their talent. And all of a sudden, we're getting, we're getting a super deal on the stage. And they're telling us, telling us exactly who to bring in. It's going to draw the crowd in from Portland. I mean, that's a whole area of expertise and, and uh, uh, bargaining ability and things that we don't have that they were able to bring to the table. So when you look at one of these cooperative events, uh, we'll make it look pretty. Uh, but everybody else is doing all these other things that make it into a great event. Another thing that we just we've just started looking at, I'm using this opportunity to rethink, and that's how we do the cook-offs. We've had mushroom cook-off and jambalaya cook-off and everything else, and they've all been competition. Okay? Now there's an inherent problem with advertising for a competition because how would you like to say, "Hi, come to Ron's on the second best barbecue there is"? That's not very good advertising. So instead of having cook-offs, there will be showcases where, uh, as we bring in these businesses to uh, to support it, it's not to, it's not to create a competition, but it's to create a showcase for the businesses. Yeah, uh, and, it's, and, and we're we're going to be retooling those based <coughs> in, on input from the folks that participated. Uh, you know, again, uh, we need that industry point of view and that industry expertise to do it right rather than us just making something up and telling them that's the way it's going to be. Yeah, I'm not quite sold on the, the lack of competition. I was not participated many years and didn't win, but it was, I know the folks that did, and, got the, and even as I give out the mayor's awards, there's a lot of joy yeah. in just receiving some recognition for what it's done, so I don't know about completely eliminate yeah. All that said, we just now started talking to some of the restaurant folks, so no guarantees on exactly what form it will be in by the time we get done with the process. So well, the struggle was always the amount that had to be prepared and transported and stored. I mean, it was Herculean sometimes, especially the chowder. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, well, they, the other problem is a lot of these places have to shut down that day. Right here. Yeah, I had to close my store to come in and do it. Yeah, and that's a big commitment. And if you need to deliver enough value, where that seems like a good idea. Right. I have any questions. Yes. Um, so if we are promoting the food scene um, as part of the culinary center, I see it as just, I don't really think food scene when I think of what you said. I think of antiques. And those kinds of things. People say, and I 
work here and we have a lot what are you here for? Shots in the MP. Very rarely did I hear people say, really awesome food scene. It didn't happen. So could there be a way, and obviously not with the Culinary Center, but with the BCP to showcase antiquing the same way? So it's okay. not just extend, it's not just one section of where you can spend your money in the city. Yeah. Something that is, you know, obviously you you are doing work for the antique week already, um, similar to the, the culinary center and you know the booking agent. So you're you know you're in the three major industries. You're you're already doing that. So if it would be yeah. Well, the, the the beauty of antique week is again, it's not really us. The antique stores got together. They came up with a prize pool. They developed a, a contest. They. Uh, they worked out a way to have the appraisals done over at the cultural center, and you know we promote it, but they own it, and you know because of that, um, you, you get an element of pride. You, you, they're all business people, so they want to do it more efficiently, effectively, and better the next time around. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we, you know, we want to really encourage. Uh, that's a great example, and yeah, we definitely want to promote the antique scene. And then I didn't understand completely the culinary center does have an educational aspect to it mm -hmm. is that something that you can it's baby steps uh we not so it's just with people you know they do like the mayor, so yeah no, um the, the the original vision of the uh the, the culinary center and i, I spent a, a good bit of time talking to rob pounding up at the, the blackfish cafe because he was the driving force behind that then was that the Culinary Center, among other things, would be a resource for the restaurant community in Lincoln City by training people and getting them into that industry to, to launch people on a career that would end up with them being a, a chef somewhere. And, uh, and it, it's a small program and it's a baby step and it's proof of concept that uh, we're working with students from Career Tech that have come in and uh, taken classes with chefs from town, teaching them. We've, we've had uh, Rob Pounding in. Um, we had, uh, uh, oh, this is bad, I'm liking on the name, the, uh, the chef at the, uh, the, the casino, uh, Jack Strong. Jack Strong. Uh, and other folks come in and teach them knife safety, commercial kitchen etiquette, uh, how to make stocks, you know, all the basic skills. And already two of them got jobs out of it, which I think is just phenomenal. Uh, um, we're going to be having a talk with the community college about expanding it. Uh, we've been in touch with the folks at Taft High School because they have a culinary program there. Now that we kind of have proof of concept and we've learned how it kind of works, we want to see if we can flesh that out and make it bigger and better. But, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the community, uh, again, seating people for a demo to actually sit and watch the chef do something. I can touch 24, or yeah. 24 people at a time, which you're right, right. doesn't move but the needle. But, it, but if it's, yeah, and then locally, Channel 4, the city controls it, we can pipe out those cooking classes on Channel right. 4 and let the whole That's city see it. Yeah. That's what I yep. refer to. Yep. Do we run into any kind of danger ahead of that? Then falling outside of your purview, that is no longer a visitor or con convention or conference activity. Um, that's looking funding. That's why I would want to do it in partnership with Samaritan Hospital, to where we make it available. But it's their show, okay? Uh, where it doesn't soak up resources that I should be using to promote to people outside of town. Yeah. But but in terms of that. Uh, the original mission for the uh, the culinary center, the idea that it would be uh, an education uh, resource, it would be a source of staffing for restaurants, and it would be a general benefit to the community in terms of nutrition and all that. We're trying to put all those pieces in place. Uh, do I want to be in charge of the cooking show that the Samaritan Hospital does? No. <laughs> well, and I appreciate this because one of my, my biggest complaints about the culinary center in relation to other centers in the city. Yeah, I can go to the community center pretty much day or night. I can go to the cultural center day or night. Yeah, but I can't go to the culinary center. That may, that may be changing. Yeah, and I like that, the direction that, you're going That may be that. changing. Um, the other thing we want to look into, and this is 
way down the pike and won't happen anytime soon. But as a kind of as a test, we put that wire rack in there with some gourmet salt and all of what we can't keep in stock as far as people mob it. As long as a little bit's used in one of the recipes, it's gone. <clears throat> um, I think we want to expand that, maybe not physically, maybe online. But anybody that makes anything in town that's a food product, that's a local business, I wouldn't mind showcasing through the Culinary Center, be it an online store or uh, maybe rotating stock on the little wire rack or whatever. But, uh, you know, if, if, if there's a little company here making hot sauce or grinding coffee or whatever, I'd love these Culinary Center as a marketing tool for them. Yeah, I'd like to be aware of businesses in town who are marketing those products. Mm -hmm. so, um, there's one product upstairs that I know is sold at a retail store in town. Yeah. Now, we don't want to be in competition with anybody. That's the big red flag with anything that we do. Uh, on the other hand, if we can help uh, a local business be healthy and give them another sales outlet, exactly. as long as nobody complains that I'm stealing business from a retail outlet, I we're happy to do it. And uh, we're going to have to kind of get rolling through here. Okay. Is that pretty much what you've got in? That's it. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, Ron. Okay. Um, so just to highlight a few things, so we're moving now to planning and community development. Uh, just want to take a few minutes. I'm going to let Richard do all of the heavy lifting on this one, uh, but to talk, uh, just to give some updates on a few things that were the projects we're really working on in 2017 and then just let the conversation go from there. We are, uh, uh, the first is the comprehensive plan uh, update. Uh, we budgeted about $93,000 uh, for that. Um, that. That update consists of the, a buildable lands inventory, a housing needs assessment, the economic opportunity analysis, a public outreach and visioning process, and an update, and then the update of the comprehensive plan. The buildable lands inventory, the housing needs assessment, the economic opportunity analysis will be finished by the end of March. And then we received three responses to the visioning and public input phase of the conference plan. And we'll be holding interviews within the next couple of weeks and then bringing that uh, uh, before you for your approval. Um, estimated time to complete that project is about 18 months uh, for the whole thing. Anything you want to add to that, Richard? Um. No, you well, you covered a lot. Uh, um, the first, uh, the first part that we're that we're looking at for the public process is the visioning process, and as Ron mentioned, we've got uh, uh, some responses to our request for proposals. We'll be interviewing them later this month, and then we want to. The, the point of, of having them is is to have a, a really inclusive, really broad-reaching uh, public participation. First step is visioning and asking people who are in the community what they want the community to be like in 20 to 40 years or whatever. And the idea is to do it in a lot of innovative ways. In other words, not just do a meeting here or a couple meetings here, but meetings, uh, uh, events, all kinds of things we're going to be working on those things all to so make sure we get a, a real broad reach, uh, get a lot of community participation so it's not just uh, uh, staff and people who happen to show up at, at the meeting here. Uh, at the and then from that, we will work on developing uh, city goals and policies and uh, to carry out those goals. And I will be looking real hard at, at housing, transportation, economic development, uh, natural hazards. Um, would that be a good opportunity or place to talk more about neighborhood association development or whatever? Yeah, and, and you know, one part of the uh, the uh, comprehensive plan that we're required to have is about public participation and uh, promoting neighborhood organization <coughs> neighborhood groups is just a really good way to accomplish that. Yeah, we have a few of the groups and else got. Um, but uh, it would be good to have, have others that are, that are more active. 
so maybe it's time to look at the public and government. Yeah. Yeah. The plan itself, that's, you know, maybe it's time to look at it. So there's different types of organizations or relaxing some of that list or making it easier for people to become, to organize in their neighborhood. Yeah. And, um, I'll go a little bit out of order, I think, of what Ron has up there. Uh, with permission. Uh, You're on. It. Once we have the uh, vision, the goals, and objectives, and so we have a, a new plan in place, then the next step will be uh, looking at our ordinances to make them consistent with the plan. Right. Well, I suspect what we'll end up with is a major overhaul of our zoning ordinance. Our comp comprehensive plan is from the 90s. Our ordinances are from the 80s. Uh, they were amended probably a couple hundred times since then. We haven't taken a, a, a systematic comprehensive look at our ordinances, so we're going to have to do that. Um, there's a lot of changes that are needed in our ordinance. Some just comply with, with the state of federal law changes, but uh, some, are, some things in our ordinance are just outdated. And if I might add to that, it's not just the comprehensive plan. Uh, we have been in, we have either approved or in the process of approving now the transportation system master plan, the parks and recreation master plan, the walking and biking plan, the Nelscott Gap refinement plan, and then on the emergency preparedness side, we also have multi-jurisdictional uh, natural ha hazard mitigation plan and the Emergency Standard Operation Procedures Manual. So all of those have either been approved or in the process, and those may or may not affect our uh, ordinances as we go through and uh, look to see where there are the inconsistencies. And all of those are uh, background materials for the Congress plan, so they're like inventory documents. You know, there's a, a stack of documents on my desk right now. And Ron, maybe if, if we could discuss at another time in, in full council about uh, the, the neighborhood association. We don't encourage them. I'm not sure we have that down. So it'd be a good discussion to have. So. The, only I, the only other thing I have to say is the integration between all those separate plans. So they don't look like silos because nothing works like that. Everything is kind of right. connected and integrated. And so if there's an opportunity to point to the other plan, <laughs> it would be real helpful. I okay. um, any other questions pertaining to the conference of plan? Okay, in 2016, um, under Richard's direction, his staff uh, began to hold uh, focus groups or outreach groups with uh, builders um, and uh, builders to talk about our permitting process, okay? And uh, not so much about the ordinances as far as a setback or building height or something, but just the permitting process. It was very effective. We learned a lot. We learned things that we did well. We learned some things that we needed to make some changes. During 2017, we want to continue that process, uh, continue still with some of the permitting with other groups, but also to go beyond that. Um, in one of my uh, uh, Friday visits to some businesses, um, uh, I was in Ocean Lake and uh, stopping in and speaking with several of the businesses. And a couple of them said, you know, there's some things about your ordinances that really harm our businesses, and we sure would like to see those change. That's the kind of input that we're going to be seeking out through these focus groups. So we can bring those to you to decide, to, to, to lay out the pros and cons of these kind of suggestions, and uh, leave them as is, change them, modify them, overturn them, whatever it may be. But uh, it will be to continue to hold those different types of meetings with uh, with all those that are affected by land use in, in our community. Um, yeah, actually, uh, the uh, 
the meetings that we held with contractors and builders was about building permits. And uh, most of what I heard in terms of, of, of criticisms really just fine-tuning things. Um, what were the major, major criticisms? The, a lot of it came back to time, how much time it takes to get something through. And uh, some of the suggestions will help on that and things like that. Uh, when somebody wants to build a house, uh, almost always the roof truss requires engineer, uh, an engineer stamp on the truss calculations. And uh, the engineers are way behind. So if somebody comes in for a building permit, they can't do it until their engineer stamps things. That ends up slowing them down. So what we're looking at is can we process it pending get the engineer stamped. They will be stamped, I mean, they will be. But just so we can process it through instead of holding up the miller waiting for the engineer stamp to just process it through that kind of thing. Um, there were some things they liked. A lot of places, uh, if you want a building inspection, you call in and you get it on a certain day. Like, say, I need an inspection on tomorrow or whatever. So it's like, okay, we'll send an inspector out tomorrow. Maybe somebody has to be there all day. We do it at you know, a.m. or p.m., and the builders are really very short of that, so it just saves them half a day of, of sitting around. Um, one of the concerns they had, and this, is, this has been going on uh, forever, is that we're not a full service jurisdiction. We don't do all our proposals. The county handles what they do. Because um, uh, uh, of their constraints, they only come up here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to do their inspections. And that can that kind of builders are concerned about that. Several years ago, we looked at being a full service jurisdiction and taking it over in Lincoln City, uh, building and plumbing for the county. And the county rejected it. I certainly understand why. A big part of their business, if we take that away, then uh, how do they pay for their uh, plumbing and electrical service everywhere else in the city? Uh, there's, there's some tension over that, and you know, maybe eventually we'll be able to be full service to the I don't see that thing uh, in the near term. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, the other thing, the other big project, uh, well, the next of the big projects we have is the village of Cascade Head. Um, and I think I'm just going to let you take it and explain where we are and where we're going and what's worked. In. Okay. We, uh, we own 363 acres of the villages of Cascade Head, and uh, there are actually uh, two 20-acre pieces that we don't own, as well as the uh, area of Maple, which is where the existing house is right now. Um, in 1996, and then amended 98 to approve the plan the master plan for the whole village's property. A very ambitious plan, 1,829 dwelling units uh, for, the, for the whole project. And when you think that in, in a normal average year, we do 40 to 60 new houses a year. So if we didn't build any anywhere else in the city, it would take at least 30 years to build out the buildings of Cascade Head, and nobody else built anything in house. And there are huge engineering problems in, in that anyway, because of elevation uh, in, the, in the villages a multi-million dollar water reservoir and pumping stations and so on. So uh, we put out a request for proposals for uh, uh, someone to prepare a preliminary master plan, new preliminary master plan for the villages, so that looking at engineering realities, economic realities, is what, what is as a practical matter possible as opposed to what is theoretically possible where you can have all those huge number of units. Um, and uh, we got responses and we picked uh, a consultant to help with that. Um, and we, we, have not, we haven't issued the contract yet, but um, uh, we're very pleased with the, with the group uh, that is doing it. Actually, it's many of the same people that are working on the uh, Melscott Gap project. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we 
for uh, expecting a fairly uh, six to 12 month project. I'd like to be able to work out the details on that, but to make the plan a little just much more realistic. Um, one thing that uh, uh, you know that in the existing plan, that may go over that's far north, which is it's all been rough enough for the utilities and the road and everything. And we uh, went out with a request for qualifications uh, to basically have that developed, uh, whether it would you know, they pay us for the land or whatever. And uh, uh, some, some might say uh, that process was a failure. I'll say it was, it was an experiment that uh, uh, we didn't get much in the way of response. One thing we learned is that developers don't like to pay us. And uh, we basically said, we have this property, tell us what you'd like to do with it and how much you'd pay for it. And it was just, we didn't get a good, good response on that. So we're, we're uh, looking at an alternative approach where uh, rather than go out with a request for qualifications, uh, maybe deal with someone in the real estate marketing and get them to directly approach developers to, to, uh, who have people have the expertise in getting developers who can come in and do a, do a good job on, on uh, building out the firm property. I should explain that it's a preliminary master plan, by the way. The villages in Cascade is a plan unit development. And uh, with the plan unit development, you, the planning commission approves a preliminary master plan, which is the developer saying, or the property owner, this is what we want to do in this property generally. And then there's a final master plan which uh, is much more refined where they put in the detail. Uh, the preliminary master plan is, is concept kind of thing. What we've done in the past with the villages, we had a preliminary master plan for the whole villages, and then there was there were three so-called villages, and then there was a refined preliminary master plan for one of the villages. And then within that there was there be final master plan for individual blocks. And we may end up going with something like that uh, uh, again because it's such a big project. Uh, it would take time and it can end up being dispersed to different developers as it goes. So that's why this, this step is just basically going back to square one and saying, what's a good master plan for the project? Any questions? Well, have we ever said as a city what we want exactly within some of these this area? Have we ever said we want a school, we want a hospital, we want a this, we want a that? That's what this is about. Whether do we want do we want housing? Do we want commercial? Do we want but we institutional? Do we want an art college? You know, what what is it that we're looking for? Right, we have not done that. Well, the plan is 20 years old, and it's not been up I don't want to ruffle feathers and get a big discussion going here tonight. Time's running out, but have we completely abandoned the idea of selling it off completely? All at once? Yeah. Just turning control back over to someone well, else. Uh, I did have a discussion with a person that was interested in it. The only offers that we have had so far may have not been worth it. Um, the price has been really low. And I did have somebody who contacted me and said, are you interested in selling? I said, where is you? We'll entertain the discussion. And uh, and they initially started low and said, no, we got those kind of offers before. Then they jumped away on it. I said, well, now you're getting into the territory. And that's where it is. Good, we're back to the If we do something like that, I think it would be real important to have a development agreement in place. <coughs> oh, absolutely. I just want to make it important enough that it's still uh, Advocating for it. I, I think we're, uh, we've been taking the approach that we're open to, to the offers as long as they're realistic offers. But, okay. Well, we're here. Uh, the next, well, I've actually got a couple things beyond this that shouldn't take very long that I needed to bring up. But the next thing we wanted to bring, uh, just to bring before you, is workforce housing. And I've asked Allison to touch base a little bit on what we currently do 
um, as it pertains to workforce housing. Okay, Alison, I haven't you introduced yourself at the beginning of the year. Uh, no, I'm Alison Robertson, I'm City Urban Renewal. Um, what we currently do, well, Richard, Richard has more of a plan than what we currently do. Uh, I personally sit on the board for the Lincoln Community Land Trust and uh, have done so since 2007. And um, the Land Trust uh, works for providing home ownership opportunities for those um, working in Lincoln County. It's a county-wide organization. And the median family income for that um, to qualify is anywhere from 60 to 120 percent um, of the income. So, um, anyway, that's kind of my focus. <coughs> I've um, gone to many conferences and workshops on housing and just kind of uh, needed to get up to speed on various housing um, issues. So, um, a couple things that I wanted to bring up uh, with affordable housing. I've got more to add later, but um, affordable housing is a national issue. We're not alone in this. Um, it's typical of service based economies. New construction costs are high, and uh, there's not enough supply. Plus, a lack of living wage jobs means that many who are house, uh, we have many who are housing burdened, and housing burdened is uh, one of those definitions. You want to be cautious with definitions when you talk about housing. Um, housing burdened is people paying more than 30 percent of their income for housing. Uh, very little housing gets built in general. Richard just mentioned that with the village's property, you know, at the rate of. 40 to 60 a year um, in terms of units, and then um, let alone affordable housing getting built every year. Typically, the new construction of today is our affordable housing in 20 to 50 years. Uh, let's see, when, when we are talking about housing, we want to be clear with definitions. Uh, we want to um, really focus on the difference between rental versus ownership models. I mentioned the land trust, that's an ownership model. Uh, we have a need for both sorts of models. And um, is it affordable, is it workforce, or is it affordable workforce? You can see how these terms get um, pretty, very muddy seen. Uh, some observations that I've had in a small town, it can be difficult because of the scale. And so it can take a lot to develop and administer a program for very few units. So it can be frustrating, but um, we're the only way at it. And uh, Lincoln City has unique advantages. Uh, we have slow population growth, which means we have an opportunity to catch up with our need a little more than other parts of, of the nation that are growing more quickly. And uh, we also have um, a, a unique city form. Our uh, town is long and skinny. So that means uh, Highway 101 is our main street. And so most parts of town are close to services, school, and transit. We also have lots of infill sites uh, for housing. And with infill sites, that's in, in parts of town that are already developed, it's less expensive to use land that already has infrastructure rather than building in areas that doesn't have infrastructure. So we have lots of tools, um, but subsidy is still needed in order to get some of these units built. Uh, and subsidy can come in the form of money or land. Uh, the city currently has a revolving loan fund, which is about $130,000, and that's a fund that can go out to organizations that are building housing and then get paid back, usually with occupancy. And uh, we have used that for two of the land trust homes. So those are the only two homes that the land trust has in its inventory, and they are both in Lincoln City. Uh, the city can also do system development charge deferrals for things that are of high need which uh, we did with the Samaritan Early Learning Center, and uh, we also did for the land trust homes. So those SDC fees were then paid when the homes were sold. We also have habitat for humanity uh, in the area, and um, we can renovate our existing housing stock. There are some loans for habitability, so people can remain in their homes. In the past, the city has participated in these loans, uh, very low interest loans, or loans that are um, basically just uh, the payment is deferred for the home sells. That's been through the Community Services Consortium, which is funded by the state, and as we know, uh, those funds, um, I believe, haven't existed for a few years now. Um, so that's a, a state funding issue. Uh, demographics, we, um, we should be focusing on aging in place. We have an aging population. 
And there are different things that we can encourage, like um, creating housing with designs that have um, living units you know, on the ground floor. <coughs> so it might be a two-story unit, but a person can live just on the first floor. There's a bathroom, a kitchen, and a bedroom. Um, so that if they can't get up and downstairs uh, temporarily or permanently, then they can still stay in their homes. A uh, variety of housing types is good for the market, so single family attached. Um, and then mixed income neighborhoods is good for the community. And accessory dwelling units, which we do allow, but they could uh, be encouraged somehow. Urban renewal uh, as an economic development tool, we are limited to the urban renewal district mostly along Highway 101 and mostly commercial properties. So um, we don't have a lot of residential area in the urban renewal district as it stands today. The urban renewal plan was written mostly for infrastructure improvements, and that's how we've spent most of our money over time, which have been great. Uh, we can't do everything, and that has been our focus for um, a good portion of the time that we've been around. Uh, we can spend urban renewal funds to acquire property, and we have done that, but it's been for commercial, not residential. And um, funds can be used to partner with developers and builders on workforce housing. Um, we have done it for commercial or mixed use, uh, which again is the zoning in the majority of the urban renewal district. So not a lot of opportunities uh, have come along. And we also haven't been able to do that for a few uh, for most of the years. We did an amendment to our urban renewal plan in 2009, and we added uh, economic development as a tool, and that included the uh, workforce housing part. So um, that's all I've got for now. Um, so I next time chair. Do it in your own. Okay. Thank um, you. Well, I had a couple questions for Alex. Is that okay? Yep. I'll make them really short. <clears throat> On our uh, our workforce housing, do we, how short are we? Do we know how many units we're short? We don't know at this time. We have um, the comp plan is great timing for this conversation because the housing needs and uh, assessment and the building of lands inventory are kind of working part and parcel to create that picture. So we're close on knowing that real specifically. Okay. And then the next question. Uh, our population is a lot more transient than it used to be, including the professionals. I talked to the school district. And they're losing people just because they find a better job in Baltimore or something, and off they go. And they'll be there for a couple of years. If we if we subsidize their purchase, you know, with free land or whatever, what's to stop that those people from selling their house in two years and pocketing the profits? And all we did was for naught. Um, that's a good question and, and important, especially with public investment. Um, there are different models, and each model has its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, with the land trust, you're talking about home ownership, but mm -hmm. the, that sort of a professional who isn't looking to stay permanently yeah. in the community would probably be better served with a rental uh, model. But um, with home ownership, we have Habitat for Humanity, which um, is a wonderful organization that has their own financing, and um, they serve 60% of the median family income and below, whereas the land trust serves 60% and above. Um, and the land trust, when you make that investment in the home, the land stays in trust and the home is sold. So the land um, is kind of like a subsidy and ensures that the home is sold um, or kept affordable over time, sale after sale. And with Habitat for Humanity, that um, that family or individual would really reap the benefits of that full equity investment when they sell, but then the home would go at, at to the market rate. Um, where actually the land trust is looking to partner with Habitat for Humanity because there are some um, kind of hybrids of the two where you can take the strengths of both. So we're um, starting to talk more and more about that, but we just haven't fleshed out those details at this point. So, um, but you're right, that's something to. Last, there last are uh, uh, provisions sometimes that are used where if there's been a kind of subsidy, the amount of equity increase that the owner gets is capped. And above that goes back into the into the trust or whatever to recapture. So it stays affordable because the person who buys it uh, gets a, still gets a little price. And you just hate to have somebody make a windfall. Yeah, a lot of this stuff, you know, we, you know, we can 
uh, you know, do away with property taxes, do away with SDCs or something. It, it, care has to be taken that we're not just putting money in, in the builder's pocket or the, the first owner's pocket or whatever. So, Richard, what's that called when you have a business below and residents up above? Mixed. Is that mixed use? Mixed use. Mixed use? Have you ever thought about doing it here in City Hall with that first, fourth floor? We talked about that. Um, and there's actually, I'm going to, I'll discuss a little bit when I get into my thing about some. There can be uh, hidden traps. Kind of but it is, it, in general, it's a good idea. We would it supports it because it does get uh, get uh, uh, can make it, housing can be cheaper that way. Um, and also, there could be just good for the community in general because you have that ice on the street where then we have an abandoned commercial area at night. So the Ridge Apartments, uh, I'll be done here. The Ridge Apartments, isn't that the, wasn't that a subsidized? Uh, yeah. Okay. They've got more land. Why aren't they? Why aren't they putting another structure up? <laughs> that was, it was developed before I got here, but they have. I think they maximized their density given the amount of land that they had. Um, I'd have to go back and take take a look at it. There, there were some conditions put on it, and some of it may have been where their funding came from. They said, you know, "Here's how much we're willing to give you." Oh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure I should, I should put into that. I don't know. Yeah, I, it, it was actually, it was maxed out initially. There's been some changes, and there's just a sliver that could be uh, some additional units. But, but it wasn't that way originally. Uh, the other is uh, the traction isn't in rural Oregon for subsidized, federally subsidized. Projects. Um, if you watch the state, you know, they push for the higher metropolitan areas, tax credits, federal, those kind of things. So, there's, to answer your question, why they haven't done anything, they lose out because it's competition for the dams to get tax credits. Thank you. And then, one thing I think Alan said that needs to be brought uh, we have to have the state in this discussion too, um, in particular with uh, rental houses, because as they keep passing more and more onerous or anti-landlord bills, less landlords will exist, and you can't have a rental without a landlord. Someone's got to buy that property first. So, I mean, I plan on talking at the state and at the city made capital to different people about that. Um, they're, they're, anyway, I think they should be part of the discussion. Oh, that's a great point. I, and I think um, I was talking with uh, Lizzie, and she mentioned there were a couple of families that had crossed her path that um, the units had been moved from rent to sale and they were displaced because of those decisions. So it's, um, we need to have some balanced rules. Okay. Moving on. Okay. Um, Susan asked that I do uh, uh, present uh, uh, a PowerPoint that I had done a few months ago as part of a, an online thing, so I got that here uh, this afternoon. Um, and it was called Three Strategies for the Rural Housing Shortage. And it isn't three strategies, it was the third seminar that they did. So there was one strategy for something else the first time or something. Anyway. So this is just my part of it. Um, looking at, at uh, land use tools that I was involved in, it. I was the, there was I was the city planner. They had a, a funding person and a, a state uh, a state person. I, I was in the middle, so I'm going about what the tools are that are available. Um, we talked about accessory dwelling units, um, and under our rules that we have here, uh, every lot can can have an accessory dwelling unit, can't be greater than 750 square feet or 50% of the size of the main unit, uh, whichever is smaller, can be separate, it can be attached, so it can be in the basement, can be in the attic, can be above the garage, can be a standalone. Um, the uh, the uh, illustration on the left, it shows, it shows an attached one uh, stuck on the, uh, on the back of the house. The other illustration is one above a garage, a standalone. 
Um, our uh, requirements are for an accessory dwelling unit, you only have to have one parking space rather than two that we require for uh, uh, a normal single family dwelling. And uh, it's, a, it's a kind of infill, really. Uh, so you make really good use of your existing infrastructure. You don't have to extend streets, you don't have to extend new sewer lines or new water lines, you just need the service connections and you're there. We allow them at one per lot, so it effectively doubles the density of, that's allowed in the city. Um, we've had a, a very limited response to this, and uh, that's been the pattern in other communities too. What Portland found, they had very limited response when they uh, uh, took off the I think they took off the, the separate SDC requirement. Just went through the roof that they were built. Also, communities have found that where we have restrictions on design, such as we have, which we require the design to be compatible with the adjacent structure, uh, and where we where there's a, a, an owner occupancy requirement, <laughs> those two things tend to limit uh, people's interest in having accessory dwelling units. Those were taken away. Um, we find that there's more interest in that. So that's something we've got to be thinking about uh, over the next uh, next little while. Then we also have cottage clusters, which is uh, groups of four to twelve smaller units, uh, up to a maximum of 1,250 square feet. But most of them are required to be uh, uh, 800 square feet or fewer. Um, clustered around a central. Uh, green area, open area, common area, reduced parking depending on the size of the, the structure. If it's uh, 750 square feet or smaller, there's one parking space. If it's uh, between 750 and 1,000 square feet, it's one and a half parking spaces per unit, rounded up to the next whole number depending on how many units you have. Then above 1,000 square feet is the normal, normal two. Again, this is another one that doubles the allowed density. No, Olivia Beach is not uh, uh, a cottage cluster at all. In fact, their density is based on uh, uh, the whole land. It's a PUD, the whole land, and it's uh, 750 square feet per unit. They have their density, you know, whatever their square footage was, divided by 750, or less than 7,500. That's how many units they get. We did, uh, we're having discussions actually on some property adjacent to uh, uh, Olivia Beach about doing a cottage cluster there, and the builder ended up deciding he didn't want to do that, but it's, it's uh, a possibility out there. They're starting to get some interest in it. Um, yeah, this is just an example. This happens to be in Colorado of cottage clusters. The mixed use, uh, uh, this photo actually is in uh, Depot Bay, just we was able to get a, a decent shot of it in Depot Bay. Um, we allow it in all our commercial zones in the city and uh, it can be above or in back. Uh, and uh, uh, commercial has to be either on the ground floor, in, in front, or, <coughs> or below, depending on, on whether. So you still have that commercial frontage. Uh, uh, so we have the commercial activity is, is essentially the, the primary activity, but you can also have residential buffers. And uh, a lot of communities have minimum dwelling sizes. Um, we don't. With one exception, and that's for a uh, manufactured home, has to be at least a thousand square feet. This home actually was built, uh, it's on Anchor Avenue, it's 638 square feet um, on a full size lot. Um, but it's a, you know, you know, a small house costs less to build than a big house does. And so uh, if you don't have that minimum size requirement, then people can. can uh, Smaller. Uh, I think we need to take a look at the uh, uh, manufactured home uh, uh, minimum size requirement that we have too. Is the, the technology of, of manufactured homes has changed a lot since this was put into effect actually back in the 70s. It's 
or yeah. how do the park models, <coughs> park, those park models, how do they get around that? They are uh, exempted, they're, they're technically an RV, but I'm getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these have become a, a big deal, big movement nationwide, or even internationally. The uh, the even on the right edge is a park model RV, and that's in an RV uh, uh, RV park here in the city. Um, no, it's not here in the city. You can tell by the model. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The one on the left is a tiny house. You can see it's on. We, we can't see very well with its resolution. You can see the trailer tongue in front. It is on wheels, and they typically are on wheels. Um, they uh, uh, obviously reduce the dwelling cost. They're small. It's, it basically, it's like living on a boat. Now, you know, it's real compact space. You have to really take take advantage of, of all your space. Um, one thing that uh, have, has been a concern with the tiny houses is because they are on wheels, they're not houses, so they're, they have been and, uh, exempted from building codes. They, sometimes they're subject to the, man, the manufactured dwelling code, depending on how big they are. Sometimes uh, they're subject to the RV code. Sometimes they're completely uh, uh, outside of it all. And one of the big concerns has been like electrical wiring. If it doesn't have to be up to code, then there's a real, real issue with that. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the, uh, it, the, the the way of county houses are built is evolving. You're seeing pretty much everything being at least being up to electrical code. One thing that's happening with the building code right now, they're going through their uh, periodic. Uh, uh, updating process, and right now, one thing they're looking at is uh, allowing what's called a ship's ladder to access a sleeping loft, as long as there's another way out through a, a window that meets this meets standard size. You can use a, a, a ship's ladder down into the main area, uh, and that could then be allowed to, to be used for sleeping space. Now, ship's ladders, you just think of a basically a ladder with railings. They're real space saving, that's why they're used on ships. That's also important for uh, for some of our guarantees because the, you know, they have a sleeping loft and if they can't have a, 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 a code, up to code stairway going to it, then it can't be used for sleeping. We've had some issues around that. But we're seeing uh, uh, there very likely will be a code revision in Oregon. It's already happened in Washington. Very likely will happen uh, this year in Oregon. Um, ship's ladders for access to, to sleeping lofts. Uh, like this one, you can see on the left, there's a, a small window up at the top left. That's where the, the loft is in that one. And uh, one thing we could look at is the RV parks, which is where you know, like the, the park model is. We allow them at, uh, to be there at uh, one unit per 1,200 square feet. Um, and uh, under Oregon law, people are allowed to live in park models in an RV park, live full time. One thing we can look at is having a tiny house zone or a tiny house allowance of some type to do something similar, maybe identical, where we can allow them on much smaller pieces of property. Again, so you can really, not only do you reduce the housing cost, the construction cost, but also reduce the land cost. The opposite of that is big houses. And uh, these are, are things that look like a house, a single family house, but they're uh, actually essentially apartments. Uh, this house is a four unit apartment. Um, you can see there's, there's two stairs going up to front doors in the front, and then there's, there's something going to the lower level as well. Uh, so that, that would uh, allow. Uh, Four units, so you have the, the reduced construction cost of a, uh, essentially a, a, a multifamily dwelling. And they can be just allowed in multifamilies, they can be allowed actually in single family zones, so some places to allow that. Um, like we had a proposal uh, for, remember, the Logan Park development off of Logan Road. You see, along on the left side, there was going to be several big houses. For for that four unit big houses, which uh, 
uh, you know, from the road would have looked like a big single family home. And we also allow uh, a density bonus in plan native developments. We have a, a system of how many units you get in your in plan native development and some calculations that have to be done. But we allow a 10% density bonus if 5% of your places are affordable housing. The idea behind the, the sort of the double bonus is that those extra, say you're, you're adding 10 houses just for ease of calculation. Those extra five subsidize the five affordable houses. Actually, and we just put this in place right when the crunch hit. So we have no experience with it yet. And, uh, <coughs> it's, it's out there as an option for people. And that didn't translate very well. But um, the legislature in the session last year authorized uh, inclusive zoning, right? It, it had been illegal in Oregon where you can require uh, developers to put in affordable housing. Uh, it applies to sites of 20 units or more, and you can require up to 20% affordable housing, <coughs> but you have to provide incentives, and, uh, whether it's land or uh, uh, fee reductions or whatever. Uh, to do that. And the options are you could, rather than actually putting in the affordable housing, you can pay a fee in lieu to a fund to uh, develop affordable housing elsewhere. Um, and uh, also allows, this provision allows uh, cities or counties to impose a construction excise tax, which is a, basically a, 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 like we have for the school excise tax right now, where it's a, a dollar per square foot. Uh, you could have a similar kind of tax to uh, new construction to go into an affordable housing fund, provide for affordable housing uh, elsewhere. And then uh, talking about uh, the policy tools, local uh, lands inventory that we talked about, housing needs assessment. So on this helps you figure out what you need uh, to build, where uh, where the, where there's uh, shortages, what have you. The idea is to address that state law requires us to have a 20 year supply within the urban growth boundary of, uh, of 20 year supply of land to provide needed housing at various uh, uh, costs, uh, whether it's rental or home ownership, so you have a variety of housing. Uh, uh, the idea is to uh, guide us in developing policies so that we have provisions that ensure that those things happen. And then system development charges, you know, we can reduce them or defer them. Uh, same thing with property taxes. And, uh, Talk about my father-in-law had uh, what you call the law of conservation of problems, where if you solve the, the problem or try to solve the problem of affordable housing by reducing these fees, you're creating another problem somewhere. How are you going to pay for these things if those things are fail? So it's got to be it's got to be carefully crafted. Um, there are ways to uh, like reduce SDCs for smaller houses or so on, but that's a policy decision that has to be made. Uh, <coughs> I think it can be done in a revenue neutral way, but it's got to be done carefully and so on. It's, you know, same thing with property taxes. And even, even the, as uh, uh, Allison mentioned, sometimes just deferring can be a huge thing. And don't collect it until the, the house is sold, rather, because we require to be paid up front when you get the building permit. Yeah, so that's money out of the builder's pocket, uh, which you don't get back until the uh, the houses were sold, but we don't require it to be paid until it's sold and uh, can uh, help to encourage uh, builders to, to go there. <laughs> and there's things like things we can do, like the infrastructure capacity. Uh, we had in the North End, you will recall, um, our infrastructure basically maxed out. Uh, the, ne the next builder who came in to build anything is going to have to put in a million dollar pumping station. And so that meant no one was going to build it. And the city, uh, perfect renewal paid for it. Uh, uh, so 
this pumping station. So that kind of thing can help to uh, reduce the cost of housing as well. And then street standards, uh, the more street you require, the wider they are, and the more costs it's getting passed through the purchaser. So reduce the, the street dimensions, reduce the development costs, reduce the housing costs. And we have our, in our new transportation system plan, we, which this is drawn from, um, we have these uh, reduced standards to allow uh, builders to build things that meet city standards, but actually end up costing less, so that statement can be passed on. And uh, we talked about, uh, we've got the affordable housing fund that uh, was set up. Uh, we've been using surplus city lots to, uh, to provide uh, opportunities for affordable housing. And then, of course, we bought the building to Cascade Head, and so we can use some of that land, whether use it itself or use it to trade for other land that can be used for affordable housing. And, and when I talk about this, people say we are so lucky to have that because it's such a huge, huge thing that uh, uh, other cities wish they had that kind of opportunity. We've got such a great, a great deal on it. And uh, we we're talking about recommendations of things to do. You got to get the word out there that these things are possible. Uh, we're finding, like with the successful <laughs> dwelling units and cottage clusters, and a lot of people really don't even know about it, and so they don't know the opportunity is there. Uh, the upfront cost, system development charges, and so on, land cost, streets, so on, things you can do. Uh, those costs are good. Educate policymakers, which is over here. And uh, watch for hidden traps. And the example I have of that, where we, we require, like in, in TAF, we require, not just allow, but require mixed use on 101 and on 51st Street, which is fine. But the building code requires certain uh, uh, things like sprinkler and Mixed use. So if someone is not anticipating that, and they will get, get told, and by the way, it's going to cost you X thousand dollars more to put a sprinkler in, can be, when you're at the edge anyway, it can be a, 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 a major, a major blow to how you end up developing. So that's kind of a hidden thing. You got to make sure uh, it doesn't track. I think that's what I've got. Yeah. Any questions that you have for our planning process? There was one other thing on the agenda that says eating wild bus. Yes, I actually have two other things to bring up, and one I think one I really need some information tonight. The other one I think we can I'll uh, just introduce it and then I'll send it to you and we can discuss it at one of your regular scheduled council meetings. Uh, the uh, legislative day, or the uh, city day at the Capitol is Wednesday, and a couple of you are going to that. And, uh, Councilor Hinton had asked me if um, if uh, if I would or should I prepare a document that uh, went above and beyond what the League uh, of Cities is prepared. Right now, the League of Cities is. Um, has identified four main priorities, and they're in the handout that I gave to you, and that's property tax reforms, recreational community, transportation funding, and first reform. They've also listed several other things beyond that, uh, including housing, natural uh, uh, land use, and natural disasters, and I'll just let you look at those from there. There is one item that uh, we have been keeping Representative Domberg informed on that we want to just mention tonight, and that is the Dee River Way Park, Wayside Park. Um, uh, some time ago, um, uh, we began talking with the state officials about the city taking over the management of that, uh, of that property. And uh, there's interest in the state on us doing that. Um, um, part of their plan in their budgeting process also includes a renovation of the bathrooms. What we're interested in doing is combining the work with them 
And so not only renovating the bathrooms, but also expanding and creating a visitor center and using some of our training and room tax money for that. Why don't you explain a little bit of the concept that you're thinking about? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the state's numbers for Beaver and Wayside, uh, there's approximately 1.2 billion people a year, according to them. Um, I'm optimistic myself, but there's a lot of people that pull in there and to watch sunsets or see the beach or whatever. And it's your it's your first look at the beach coming into town. Uh, and I really think it, it functions as our front yard. It's what gets the most attention. It's what establishes their their view of the city. It it makes a quality statement. Um, it could be a lot nicer. We have an antiquated concrete block bathroom. Uh, there is not a hint of anything that resembles landscaping. It, uh, I don't think it quite makes the statement that we wanted to make. That said, 1.2 million pairs of eyeballs go in there. If we gave them a nice state-of-the-art restroom facility, that would be a nice way to say welcome to Lincoln City in and unto itself. If we made that into a welcome center where we told them about Lincoln City, uh, we let them know about the businesses we have here, we let them know about the things to see and do and why this is a great place to visit, um, I think that would be just a wonderful investment and something to be well worth our while to take a look at. If you look at what the VCB has in reserve, we have a lot more money in reserve than we're required to. Um, I sat down with my folks. We took a hard look at it. We'd be willing to put up to $750,000 toward that combination restroom and visitor center. And unlike the old travel kiosk that used to be there, it would be 100% dedicated to promoting what we have here in Lincoln City. So the question that I really have for you today is that uh, would you like me to prepare something that affirms our support for the league's priorities plus a discussion item on on, uh, on our plans if you agree with those plans? Would, yeah. Yeah. would we as a city be required to put more money in? Well, the, the, it, it's going to be a negotiation, and the question I don't have an answer to is what is the quid pro quo. <clears throat> right now, the state's not in love with that property because there's no revenue associated with it, because there's no vending, and there never will be. Uh, so they see it as an expense, and they would rather put their money elsewhere. If we could relieve them of that burden somewhat, uh, I think it would be something they would welcome with open arms. I think where we need to be careful are things like maintenance of the seawall, which I don't think we want to take on. So, you know, if we can say we'll come to the table with a significant amount of money, but in exchange for this, we want, we need to figure out what that ask is. Well, my first city day at the Capitol, that's what I did. Let's just go around and around every single legislator and say, this is crazy that we own this. I was inspired by the uh, uh, Brooks Report. This is an eyesore here, and I, I agreed with that. Uh, I didn't meet any resistance. Every single person I spoke to, uh, senators, representatives, uh, state workers, uh, yeah, it's take it. We've only heard this, I think, from just one state agency, but that was the idea of, great, take it over, we'll walk away and not put any money into the bathroom. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. We want it to be that partnership with, with the city so that they're contributing to work contributing. So that would be a part of the message that we would put together. So if you are interested in this, I'll uh, type up something tomorrow in a letter. And then for those of you who are going, you know, I'll send it to out to everybody who want to, whenever you have a chance to talk with your legislators, or mail it to them, or however you would like to do it all. And I'll throw so my other two cents, is I think we should own the Devil's Lake State Park, too. We have not had that discussion. <laughs> Okay, uh, then the final thing that I had is that uh, it's been requested that we consider an ordinance that would prohibit feeding of the wildlife, okay? Uh, we have a draft ordinance of that. Rather than, you have not seen this yet, so rather than discuss it tonight, I think what I'd like to do is send it to you tomorrow. 
have you take a look at it, and then we'll just put it on a regular council meeting for discussion. Yes. So who is requesting this? I mean, what, where is this coming from? It's come to our staff, um, and, and I don't know who originally brought it up with our staff members, but it has come from a couple of staff members that said we should take a look at this. Well, I know a lot of people that <clears throat> feed birds in their, in their backyards. It's a big part of their uh, yeah, big yeah. part of their lives, you know. I and, do, and I'm not and it squirrels and everything else. Okay, guys, I'm going to stick with what Ron said, though, if you don't mind, because that's going to be brought up to us. Yeah, yeah, before, before you make a decision on that, I would like you to see the ordinance, to see exactly what it says. Um, we'll send it to you, and then I'll just put it on a regular scheduled council meeting as a discussion item, not as an adoption item, and then you can let us know if you like it. Go forward, throw it away, amend it however you'd like to go. Right. Uh, anyone has anything else to add? No, Ron, Ed, Allison, no. thank, you. thank you so much. Great information. Guys. We are adjourned.